storm Called Ida
Hello, it's me, Kevin Von Esper. Welcome to Von Pod. I'm a little casual today, but I have a very cool t-shirt on that's relevant to today's conversation and sort of how I got introduced to uh, the gentleman on the show today. This is my Dresden Dolls t-shirt from the, the debut album. Let's just bring him in. Are you ready? Give me a thumbs up if you're good. Hello, Martin BC. Hey, Kevin. How's it going? Good. I do like your t-shirt. Yeah, I know. It's a little it's a little snug than it used to be. More snug these days, I think. But um God, this must be what, 20 years old or something? Um, yeah, I guess so. The record is like 20 years old. That's uh, I guess. Yeah. yeah, wow. Um, well, we'll, well talk about that for sure. The the recording at least was like um 20, um, I'm sorry, yeah. 2002 so shit yeah that's 20 years ago <laughs> man so they need a 20th you know, anniversary crazy. reissue excuse me yeah, they need a 20th anniversary reissue coming up yeah you know what's funny what and i don't have this everything of dresden dolls like right next to me but i do happen to have right here <laughs> at arm's distance Ooh. the songbook oh see that's that? cool is it backwards <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's forwards. It's good. Yeah, and it has uh, you know, the songs. And it's got a description of how we tracked each song. Oh wow! You know, and it's I don't got, even it's got, know about that. No, it's really good. And it, there's it, this whole chapter of meeting Martin, and, and, and wow, there, you know, there's a there's a few errors, which is kind of funny. Like one of the songs, we got it on the first take. Then four pages later, after like ten takes, same song, right? Mm -hmm. So, but, you know, maybe different the, parts of that song. No, I think they really. I think somehow they it got mixed up in Amanda's head. Which one? I I mm -hmm. tend to believe the ten takes over the one take, but you know maybe that tenth take really felt like the one. <laughs> right. Yeah, and to just to to explain to the audience a little bit, um, Brian is someone I've known since about that time, probably like two thousand nine, around when we um, crossed paths or something like that. Um, I, I saw the Dresden Dolls, though, in like 2002 or three, like right when Girl Anachronism came out. I saw them in this tiny bar, like they could hardly fit on the stage, if you could call it that. And um, and that's sort of when I started recognizing your name. And then I was like, oh, and he's also worked on a bunch of stuff that I grew up on. That's awesome. Cool. I wonder what that place was, but yeah. Um, it was called Rudy's in Connecticut, I think. Oh, okay. Connecticut. So I know I, I lived in and I, I live back now in the suburbs uh um New York. And I remember we just like that was the closest show we could find and we drove to it. It was probably like an hour and a half, you know. And I was underage and I they didn't care. It was like this tiny bar. Like you'd never see them in some, such a place ever again. Yeah, I think I saw their first um, uh, New York City show in this desperate place called Siberia that was in a uh, Siberia in I haven't... subway station. It was really strange. I think it was into wow. the subway, like in the theater district, the, the worst part of town, huh. right? And uh, yeah, I saw them there. It was just awful. You could hear the disco upstairs booming away. Me and a friend, we felt bad for them. Oh, you know? man. <laughs> but you know it's like wow they try so hard they mean it so they really mean it but they, they still like you know in these conditions and then yeah two years later it was a different story and i think i saw amanda palmer's first solo show or just first show in brooklyn at all which was a, if you want to call it a show was she played mm -hmm. a uh, um like a a uh, a brunch in my building because the bit my building oh. manager had seen her in scandinavia like doing what? solo and was like oh my god you gotta come to my space in Bro my building in Brooklyn and like play for the tenants and then he was like told me you gotta go <laughs> and That's I didn't so know funny. I was, like, someone's in town from Scandinavia I was like okay okay I go so I went oh. I was like you know this was before dance. the record what's that this was before the record yeah this was before anything this is that's how I met her I met her at my building oh, okay. loft in our in our uh, sort of industrial building where I am now and uh -huh. uh, yeah he uh, it was like you know like his friends and uh, that's where I met her. And then I talked, then that night she hung around. So I talked to her like that night, but I, I had a session. So I, I said, I can't really go. He goes, you got to come for one song. Then I was like, okay. Who were you the recording? Do you remember? 
What's that? Who were you recording that night? Do you remember? Oh, I don't rem- I don't remember. But um, but yeah, it's funny because the building manager in the building really made it kind of happen. You know, he wow. was the one who really believed. Some, some, sometimes it's those, that's what happens on the sides. It's like like he was a real proposal. Because to me, it was like, yeah, cool songs on a piano. I didn't see the whole gigantic right. picture that the dress. No, when you, put, when you put Brian in the mix, it's like a whole explosive thing. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a lot of energy, like incredible energy. And then also just the whole cultural thing. Like, like it, it was almost embarrassing. Like, I'd never heard them. Well, Amanda just hung around. She came for like the whole weekend. So she was there on a Sunday and then just hung out. And mm-hmm. so I, I talked to her a bit. And for instance, I didn't know the word, the word busking. Right. You know? so yeah. I was, Actually, I think that's probably how I learned it, too, is through her, you know, sort of scene. Yeah. So then so then she introduced me to a lot. I'm like, wow, really crazy. You could just live on just playing it, just traveling around and playing in these like uh, squares and different mm-hmm. cities. And so she described that and she described the eight foot bride that she gets up yeah. on a thing, like eight feet dressed in white with white face. Yeah. And so um, I was like, oh, and so I, the whole picture that was all completely new. And even just the whole idea of, I guess they were sort of steampunk and um, right. that was a, that was the introduction into even just thinking like that, you know, like circus arts and this stuff. Um, and then I realized later that it actually had started in the late nineties, but I think L- elsewhere, right. maybe in Bay area or something. Um, cause I, for a minute there, I thought that that steampunk was just a Boston thing. And then, um, these still, we were here in New York city. We were still in the, in the, in the holes of the strokes at that time. That was still like, right. Mom. Yeah, exactly. Totally. Yeah. And you know what? Brian actually references that in the documentary. He was like, yes. that was what was popular at the time, the strokes and the, you know, stuff like that. Well, they were a duo, so they did have that going for them. It was kind of like the, oh, I'm thinking of the white stripes, but sa- kind of the same scene. Yeah. I mean, for a minute, there was just one of these things that just was kind of popular. There was the white yeah. stripe. You know, drums yeah, yeah, and yeah. It, and that helped. That helps. It, it normalizes certain things. We go, what a band? It's just a drummer. Hey, at least it was like rock music, you know. Yeah. Uh, what was the name and, and, of the What was the name of the place you said you saw the Dresden Dolls again? The Siberia. first show, Siberia. What was that place? Because I've never heard of that before. Was I mean, it was, was there like a? a mis- it, was, it was a kind of a miserable place. It was sort of a disco, and then it was like just off the entrance of a, like a subway entrance, like off Times Square. Yeah, interesting. You know, but I think there was a window in the venue that actually looked out onto like the stairwell of the subway. It was just not. Huh, that's not so crazy. Place. Like, I want to know what that is. Because I, I did see them probably, uh, I don't know, 2003 or four. They played at, I think, whatever is now the Bowery Poetry Club, or I don't even know if it's that anymore. Yeah, and I yeah, think that, they, I don't they know opened that... up for Mindless Self Indulgence, who was doing like a secret show. Yeah, I think at that place is gone. The Bowery yeah, place. I think it's I think it's Dwayne Reed now. It's like burlesque mostly. I think that's that's the space. Yeah, you know it's interesting to note or that Dwayne they're... Park or something. Not Dwayne Reed. That's a drugstore. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know where. I kind of know where it used to be on Bowery. Siberia was in Tribeca. Hmm. Was there like a, maybe Michael knows. Yeah, that's what Michael says. Do you know if there was like, did they do like certain kind of parties or scenes there? Because I just, I never heard of it. There could have been something that I didn't, I wasn't aware of. Yeah, that's possible. Just that, that particular night was, it was bad for them. There was like a whole disco thing like upstairs. It was not good for them. And there's nothing that I recognized. Um, I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure it was in Midtown, but who knows? It's funny because I, I think I've heard the the word, the the, the name of, for, of a venue, Siberia, later. So they mm. could be two different places. But, you know, it's worth noting that Dresden Dolls were blowing up, at least in Boston. They were a real yeah. Boston phenomenon mm-hmm. um, during the recording of the record. Mm-hmm. You know, so they, they came down and then they played at, um, uh, I guess, the place where all the, the, the what's what's that? The, the, the te- not, t- it's like the, the Electro Clash, right? So they played, they played in the, they played in that little venue, the Trash Bar in Williamsburg. Where oh, Electric- yeah. I used to work across the street from that place. Yeah. Well, that's the place where Electro Clash was happening. And they did a show right. there, which I thought was pretty well attended. I thought it was fine. Fuck, they played at the Trash Bar? Man, that must have been awesome. Well, while we were recording the record. Wow. During that time. And I remember Amanda sort of saying, you know, in Boston, too bad you can't see us there. It's a whole nother matter. So she was, was there a lot like, of people there? Which, what's that? 
Was there a, a good crowd there? I thought it was decent, yeah. They also played with a band that I think really made, helped make them, which was um, World, Infer World Inferno Friendship Society. Okay, yeah, that, that is going to be like the... <laughs> that's what I'm leading basically towards this whole show, is I want to talk about World Inferno Friendship Society. Maybe okay. we could just maybe we'll just jump into it now. Fuck it. I was gonna lead into like you know your whole career and your studio and lead up to it, but fuck it, let's jump into that. Um because actually I discovered the Dresden dolls through being a fan of the World Inferno Friendship Society. That's kind of what I was saying. <laughs> yeah, and they were like opening for them and, and bringing them to Boston and they were bringing them to New York and and then like that's a like, yeah, it must have been 2003 I saw my first World Inferno show. And I just, like, was been totally involved ever since, you know. And, of course, I remember uh, when Brian joined the band. And that's when I started working with him. And I did, um, I was doing my show Twilight Vision, which is probably how we crossed paths. Because I, yeah. I think, well, uh we had probably had a mutual friends involved with the show and um, I was filming an episode that I never finished with black tape for a blue girl when Brian was playing with them. And I know that we were at a show together at Webster hall uh, down in the studio. Is that for, for a black tape for a blue girl? Yeah. For black tape for a blue girl. And then I, cause I remember specifically we did our interview with Sam upstairs on the stage in the main room where nothing was happening that night it was so crazy just a totally empty webster hall and that was really cool and also to note for anyone who knows me watching the show um valerie gentile was in the band at the time and she was the first guest on this pod um she's in a band now called abby death and she's like uh more, she's a uh, valerie abby now and so she was involved with that as well. Um, I'm sorry, she I don't think she was on their with, album, though. With, I'm sorry, she was involved with who? Black Tape. Well, she was involved with Black Tape, yeah. Um, when Brian was little, in it. I did a little bit of work work for Black Tape. I recorded some things with Brian yes. in the band. But, you know, it's funny, all this is that, uh, okay, so World Inferno. Yeah, I so, yeah, that's what I'm leading to. Like, uh, I remember when... Ryan leaked that recording that you did of them. I was on that email chain. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I saw World Inferno before I met Amanda. Mm -hmm, so it, mm -hmm. I met Amanda in the summer before and Amanda, when I met Amanda and then shortly after Brian, right? But when I met Amanda, when she came and played in my building, that was summer of, of 2001. Wow. And that show, that crazy show at Siberia was also around then, I think, mm -hmm. like a month later. Um, because I got invited because I'd already met her. And that was before September 11th. So that's the mm. way I can easily pinpoint it. Because I remember on the day of September 11th, uh, me and the building manager, I get we get calls from Amanda. So I spoke to her on September 11th. She was wow. like, oh, yeah. That's, she was, that's quite the mark in time right there. Yeah, so I always remember exactly that it was summer 2001 because it was just before that. Um, and I'd seen World Inferno a little time before that. I don't know why I, I someone told me to go see them. And I, it was a, an introduction to something that just totally surprised me. I, I saw them in the, at this club on um, on um, Chambers Street, downtown Manhattan, that I never, yeah, that I'd never um, really seen anyone. I'd, ne I, I'd never seen anyone. The Annex? Was that? I'm trying to think. There was. I'm trying to think of what clubs were over there. I remember a place that changed names a lot. At one point, it was called the Annex. Um, one point, fuck. It was called uh, Tammany Hall. Does that ring a bell? Maybe not. Not exactly, but yeah. you know, could be. I mean, it could be called Tammany Hall because that's Tammany Hall was um, the city hall, right, in the highly right. corrupt twenties. I New think York that city. was on Chambers Street, but and I could this be was wrong. With, this was in within sight of City Hall. But, yeah, probably. Well, yeah, the two things that the three things that stuck out with World of Inferno was just packed, uh, underage. <laughs> um, and um like i'd never seen that much you know costuming i i, I, don't, I didn't want to use costuming but i don't know what else to call it you know those people dressed up as i mean i don't last time i saw something was I it halloween no it wasn't halloween okay because halloween's like their big show 
Yeah, but it wasn't that. But the, the last time I'd seen something like that was like in the 70s when I was like on tour with that band, band Gong that was a psychedelic band. And we were like playing like I was on tour and this was like 79. And uh, it was like actually like left over from the 60s. So there was a lot of, you know, really crazy dressing, freaky, uh, uh, shamanistic, mm. elf like, you know, all this stuff. And that was like the 70s. And then it just kind of went away or I guess went away, maybe just what hibernated. And so this right. was the first time I, I saw that kind of scene. And also there was buses from out of town. There was like chartered buses from like the suburbs. I kind of had the impression oh, that there was wow. one for Long Island and one for like like Westchester. I was like, wow. wow. Like I, it was like not really like a, a thing I'd really seen in New York City. Um, so I saw that and then, but but that was World Inferno and and they it was packed and so much energy. And that's those things I just- Yeah, it's so hard to explain me. them to people. It's like, yeah, they show up and they, they look very uh, unassuming and they have suits and dresses. They dress really nice. And then the whole place just fucking goes nuts. Yeah, I mean, everything there was gets people, broken. <laughs> there was like people, kids with like mohawks. Yeah, like like doing waltzes, like Viennese right. waltzes. Yeah, that's exactly so, that's exactly what it is. I, I so I don't know. So then fast forward, and then when then when I saw them at Trash Bar opening up for World Inferno, pretty sure it was oh, that it World was, Inferno uh, played that show too. Oh my god! I mean, I definitely was there with Amanda. I know that, and I'm pretty that's sure incredible. it was World Inferno. Um, because I saw them open up for, it gave me that idea because I remembered that previous show and I was like, oh, you know what? Not a bad band for them to piggyback mm -hmm. on, you know? And mm -hmm. I don't think it, it wasn't as big a turnout for World Infernos as when I saw them like a year before or something in, on Chamber Street. But still, mm -hmm. that's what I'm saying. It wasn't, that was the draw. That's why Trash Bar was not empty, right? So right. it wasn't bad. But then they did some, tour, and I really got the impression that they got somewhere on the coattails of, um, of world inferno but that that's how it happens yeah, you know? that's how it got me yeah for it, sure it, that's how bands happen you know and also some people got on the coattails of um of dresden dolls like you know skip yeah. shirey for instance um mm -hmm. it felt like he had a whole kind of career but it really started because he was like emceeing mm. you know emceeing uh dresden doll shows where he would just do a couple things say some things and then do his like um F, you know like uh uh what was like toys with effects or something you know okay and, and yeah, I don't, I don't think I ever saw Skip, but I know Brian also played with him. <laughs> with whom? Skip? No. Oh, um, yeah, Brian played Skip with Skip. Diary? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I never him. saw it, but I know, I remember the name. Yeah. Yeah, I um, went on a tour. I went on a tour with Brian playing in my band and Brian playing with this Skip Shirey and um, Elias Khan thing called... Um, right. Um, uh, gentlemen and assassins <laughs> that's right yeah see this is around the time that i was kind of like circling around those those scenes because i remember and all that these, was these details that was really kind of oil and water in terms of shows but it was kind of cool and i was i, I always remember that because i'd be opening and i always remember that I, I felt like i need to bring the show back in my set into a place that was still me but was mm -hmm. sort of that would would sort of dovetail better into them because i was kind of aware that i that that when i didn't do that it they had a rocky start like i yeah. had to like bring it down to something that just 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 contrasted more flatteringly or better you know or lent itself to the to the vibe so i had to get back into their vibe like in the last 10 minutes of my set or else it didn't seem like it go, went as well as it could go uh well, but that, yeah that, that's that, very that considerate was, of you i always look at the big picture and it shows it's all about the whole thing and you know First, yeah, I had yeah. To. Here, I'll I'll finally play it. Put a slide up. I got a whole slideshow. Um, so yeah, I that see when he was touring with you and Skip, that was kind of the time right when the Dresden Dolls had stopped for a while, and that's when he joined World Inferno, and he just kind of was everywhere for a minute. And yeah. thank God for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's 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 a good path. I mean, I I think I think um. Um, like if I was, if I was Brian's dad and, and, and knew what I know, I would have been like, just stick with Dresden dolls as long as you can. Mm -hmm. Um, because Dresden dolls is your thing. Like it was Brian's right. thing. There's right. No, yeah. There's that no was Dresden the thing about dolls it. Without, without Brian. And, um, you know, I guess I, but you can't put that on someone. He needed to try different things. And so he probably grew as a person actually doing a yeah. uh, black tape for a blue girl. Hey, can I mention? Yeah, he was playing guitar in that band. 
Like that's what that's uh, what Bri Brian was doing. Live, live, yeah. The, um, apparently Sam doesn't like loud music, so like they don't play drums on stage for Black Tape. Yeah. Okay. I mean, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> Very happy to play guitar anytime you give him a chance. So he was yeah, he doesn't. He, so he's packed. Pack has doesn't have to pack as much stuff. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that, he just that showed part. up with his back, you know, his fucking guitar case, and that was it. Well, the funny thing about the thing about black tape was that um, um, it's remember I, I think I've mentioned a couple times in our conversation that oh, this zone or even like goth in general. Here, right? we can talk about black tape. I, hear I have a I have a video accompaniment. I hope this doesn't get me in trouble on YouTube or anything. But that's your studio, isn't it? Oh, yes, it is. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah, this is the black tape music video. Out of the pleasures. And that's Ethan, who I've worked with as well with his band Noir um, over the years. Wow, amazing. But what's funny about about Yeah, we can talk is... over this. Yeah, what's funny, just worth m mentioning, is I, I've like I've said a couple times that something in New York City wasn't very gothy, you know, basically in, in so many words. Mm -hmm. but, and and when you think of Brooklyn, it's hard to say. Oh, the uh, the Brooklyn, like deep Brooklyn, um, goth scene, like it's just not something that pops into your brain. But then I kind of realized with the uh, Black Tape and also their label, yeah, right, project, that they, yeah, that there really was like a Brooklyn old school you know uh rooted um mm -hmm. goth scene and there and and i think with um i think um um with black tape they were pretty explicit i think they would use the word goth you know as as, a, as opposed to as opposed to amanda palmer who i i think still to this day probably has not said the word goth you know do you think amanda's um, goth she's a little bit goth I think she's pretty. Her goth. husband's I mean, very goth. <laughs> yeah, I think she's goth, you know. And then, um, but I think she was really fighting that. Apparently, that's why she came up with the term "punk cabaret" because she was afraid that people would label them goth, and she just was found that limiting or just didn't want it. Or also, yeah. to a lot of people, goth was a bad word, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think you could differentiate Dresden Dolls with goth, but definitely there's goth influence in the, especially the image. Yeah, and 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 the visual is important in 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 goth music. Like it's it's theatrical, you know. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, just to bring this all back to relevancy, um, to this show, Brian plays on my new record and has played on a couple of stuff that I you know things that I've done in the past as well. So he's a big, we're big fans of Brian uh, here on this podcast, and. Um, I met him around this time when he was in World Inferno and I had them on my show Twilight Vision, which was probably I'm so happy we did now because it's one of the most extensive interviews that I've ever seen with Jack Terrycloth before he died, like, you know, a year or so ago. And I'm so grateful to have had that experience. But at the end of Brian's time in the band, they recorded i don't know an album or an ep or whatever you would want to call it with you that was never officially released so i would love to hear a little bit about that well i i thought that ep went really well um i, I did it too lot, it had a lot of character and, and and felt real and 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 live and um i felt like and it was because I felt like we were all communicating. I got them at that point. I'd seen them a million times. Mm. You know, I, I kind of, I, I also. You understood I, the vibe. Yeah. And also we, we, they were really willing to communicate. Like we met a lot, you know, like, like just having, just getting together and just talking like twice or something, which is kind of a lot. Um, just mm. generally, what do we want in music? What do we think about, you know, just, just stuff like that. What, what's important, what's not. And so we really, um, or how I saw them and how, some of that was accurate and some of it was not. And they said, well, we're not really that. So then I, that's good too. So we just really, and so I felt that was all reflected in the record. And I, I, it's one of these abstract things where I just really felt it was real. I was like, wow, this is just a demo. But yet, right. I think yeah, how they sort of. They I don't think it was it. meant to be, but when he left the band, they kind of abandoned the whole thing, I guess. Yeah, it was really a shame. Um, yeah, it was. It, I think, 
uh, as a huge, huge, huge World Inferno fan, um, that was the best recording they ever did. Like they didn't, they were a very hard band to record. And um, the other best stuff that they did was uh, Don Fury, who's everyone knows as the hardcore producer. And they did those in Coney Island. But oh my God. And I think Brian told me the stuff they did with you was never even properly mixed. So what I heard was just basically, I guess, faders up. And it was like, holy shit, it's still the best recording they've ever done. How did you control the circus punks? Well, that, well, one thing that's funny, well, well, you really do know a lot about it. Uh, it yeah. was, uh, they were sort of like rough mixes. But, you know, rough mixes, wink, wink. I spent a little time on it. I bet. Yeah, it sounded yeah. pretty good. Yeah, so I mean, what I spent half an hour on each song, so it's still more than a, a typical rough mix. Because usually, right. when I think there's no point, I mean, I I whip a rough mix out because what's the point? It's not going to be used anyway. So yeah. why? Yeah, this doesn't do anyone do anyone any favors for me to spend a lot of time on it. But with that one in particular, uh, particularly, I love some of the songs. What was that? The, the Mighty Raritan or something? Yeah, yeah, Take that the ended boat up down to on their next record. Which it's did not epic. sound as good at all. <laughs> yeah, that that was just epic. I loved it. The Raritan going down the Raritan. The, the a river. I loved but, "Ladies and Gentlemen of the Road." Fucking Brian with that double bass pedal. Yeah, and uh, it was just that, like that one. Uh, Take the boat down to Trent. I mean, it was so like local mm -hmm. in a way that I yeah. just really mm -hmm. related to. Who the hell's? I'm next to this Gowanus Canal, right? That's this sort right. of storied waterway that no one wants to really deal with and i thought the raritan was sort of like that too so i really related to just it's the new know, jersey song. version i guess yeah a song about a waterway that that people would rather forget about and yeah um, jack's from so, jersey so yeah so i really related to that and um so i spent a little bit of time i i think that the reason it went well was because they all they all did think of it as a demo maybe more than i knew so they hmm. were willing to be kind of whatever and sometimes you need wow. that. It's the, it's the thing of like when you're not recording, that's a classic in the studio. Oh, tell them we're not recording, but just press, press record, right? Hmm. Th that sometimes that uh, is the best way because there's less anxiety. And also maybe they were also willing to just do it whichever way. Like I'm like, well, maybe hmm. this way is a pretty good way to do it. And they're like, they probably smartly thought, okay, well, it gets it done. And that's what Martin thinks it's best set suited for with the setup sure let's just do it without getting too picky or too overthinking it of exactly and so then that let goishness i think probably made it just kind of click and move faster um so it was and and of course i never i mean i do everything all the way right so mm -hmm. in me i didn't really treat it like a demo yeah it doesn't sound like a demo i mean and i guess this is leading up to this is my nerdy questions about it but have, do you think it will ever be finished and released or do you have anything to do with that or do you do you have do you even know who has like the tracks or do they exist um i think it'll never see the light of day hmm. I, I mean i'd be surprised i wouldn't i wouldn't say never but i would not be surprised uh, especially now that jack that died like i know it's out there but it's never been officially released um are there songs on there that were never re-recorded and released on their own? Like later? at least one, uh, "Ladies and Gentlemen of the Road," that fast one was never right, released that anywhere. Exist anywhere. No, I mean those recordings are out there, but if you know, not they were never finished, so they would be a little bit different. Right, but "Ladies, uh, ladies and Gentlemen of the Road," mm -hmm. you're saying that 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 was never appeared on a later record. No, they never re they never re-recorded that ever. I don't oh, think they one. could, I don't think they had any, I mean, respect to all the musicians in World Inferno, but Brian's drumming on that is hard to match. They played it live, but no, that's, that's the only recording of it. Well, maybe that'll make its way into, into life, a retrospective or a bonus. It'll be, it'll be yeah. something. Yeah. It, but is it, is it, that's a possibility? Like does the track still exist somewhere? Um, I think that going back and remixing it and like working on it and bringing, I don't think it's, that's something anyone kind of really wants to do that. I would doubt. Yeah. I think it would be, okay. It would just be what as it was. is. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, honestly, I would, um, I, I never think that that's a great idea because I think sometimes the recording is also a timestamp. So if it sounds mm -hmm. dated, let it be dated, you know, let it sound like yeah. 10 years ago. It sounds finished to me. I don't know if it was mastered, but like, holy shit. 
yeah, it could get mastered, maybe. I don't right. know. Or maybe or maybe or maybe someone snuck in a little mastering. Could be, could be. <laughs> uh well, let's I mean, I'm gonna go back to the, even the beginning of your career at some point, but um just to finish out this Brian stuff, like I also have I did some work with Scarlet Sales. I forgot you worked on this as well, right? Yes. And also, this is just so crazy. The face of the sun. Do you remember this? Um, yeah, that's is that with Ron Era? Uh, probably. I think. Yeah. Brian's on that. Ra Brian. Yeah. So I think what this was was you recorded Brian playing just like crazy drums, and then this guy took it and made sound songs out of it. That could be I, the, the thing. It that's was like Ron real, Ara. like heavy metal stuff. Yeah, that's Ron Ara. Uh, by the way, the reason I stuttered there mentally was because I recorded this other band called Eyes of the Sun. Mm, and I mm -hmm. was getting confused because I worked. No, with this was. Them. I think. I mean, they may have played a couple shows. I think I saw them play at pianos once. Maybe. You yeah, were there. I was there. Yeah, I was at that show. Um, also, when Scarlet Sales played at pianos, but yeah, this like. I don't think they did much with this project, so I would be would wouldn't be surprised if you didn't remember the name of it. Yeah, well, just get confused with this other band, but but I've been actually talking to Ron from that band, mm -hmm. and uh, I think he really, which is good. I like difficult. I like, I like, uh, as long as it can be discussed. I like difficult. You know, as long as difficult can be brought into it and make sense. Um, uh, Ron likes like unusual ways of songwriting. Um, so he and he likes kind of writing sort of in the studio. So he mm -hmm. kind of likes. Uh, so the fact that that uh, Brian recorded the drums, maybe with just a, I think I don't think it was just drums by himself, but drums with Ron playing like a, maybe. a weird, a weird bass. And that then mm -hmm. Ron took it and then made something else out of it. And then maybe right. even brought it back and then added some more things. The fact that it was all like very, a very strange process doesn't surprise yeah. me. For Ron. Definitely uh, strange. But that's okay, you know, as long as it's like, it's sure. just, as long as everyone's transparent about it, that's good. Everyone's, right. I like weird, you know. Yeah, I don't actually own this one, but you recorded this one as well with him? Yeah, you know, there was a, that sort of ended in a, a little bit of a weird scene. Uh, so I, I kind of. I don't know I much about the Violent Femmes era. <laughs> and um, it was a little painful for me because uh, I was really excited about recording Violent Femmes, but basically mm -hmm, sure. Brian Brian left the band, and then I just didn't hear about the material that they recorded with band with Brian. I was afraid that they tossed all the recording that was done with Brian, so I was afraid of that. Um, also, which is fine. I I usually record and mix, and I take projects where I'm a part of everything, including the mixing. Mm -hmm. But with Violent Femmes, I wasn't necessarily going to be a part of that because. Gotcha. But that's okay. So I don't even know. I think it left my hands. I don't know what happened, but they, they, they the, 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 uh, Gordon Gano and, and the other guy, Richie or whatever. I'm not uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, they were very happy here in the studio and yeah, somehow they parted ways with Brian. And so I'm afraid yeah. for that material. So if you're holding that up and if it at all, has Oh, I think it can I mean, this, this is an album with Brian that you worked on that is out, has been out for years. So, and my name's on it. I, I don't have a physical copy of it, but yeah, it's on like online on Discogs and everything. Let well, me uh, let me pull it up. Well, if I well, I'm also not that 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 uh, focused on my name, but right. if, if, if it's the recording I did, then hallelujah. Yeah, I think so. Uh, let's see. We can do anything. Let's check it out. Um. Oh well, I can't read that, but let's see. I I unless they record it somewhere else, yeah, record it at DC Studios and a Yay! bunch of other places. So at least some of it recorded by oh my god, it was recorded like by a, like ten different people, but you're one of them. Okay. Yeah. There's only ten I songs. I mean, that's, that 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 makes my night. Yeah, this came out in 2016. So, okay. Sounds yeah, right. congrats. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I do want to play the trailer for the documentary at some point, but 
Before that, you know, we had another guest on this show a couple weeks ago that you worked with. So maybe um, maybe you can talk a little bit about Jane Jensen. Yes. Oh, yes. you want me to talk, talk about her? Yes, yes, please. And I have this, but I forgot it upstairs. So I have, you know, the Burner album. Yeah, it's always pleasant to open an album and be like, oh yeah, Martin worked on this. That's awesome. Yeah, I think I I think I just started a conversation with her in CBGB's. Hmm. You know what? She was always a Swans fan. Okay. And that there was makes one sense. of the people in Swans was in, in this band called Unsane. I think that's what it was. Okay. And CB, CBGB's oh, had the main club, and then they would often experiment with a, an annex next, next door. The gallery. There was gallery, and then I think there was pizzeria on the other side. Oh, of the I don't room. remember that I one. It's a little scary of a thought, but there was huh. um that yeah, there was CBGB's pizza. So so wow. I think for some weird reason I was like, was like I, I was over um at the pizzeria and then she was sitting there. I just started a conversation. It's amazing because uh, that in was my she playing mind, or she was just hanging out? She was just hanging out. And then what I think that the next time I saw her was, Oh, we were talking. And, and then I said that I didn't really understand what she was. I, I didn't get what even kind of music, but she said she played acoustic guitar. So I remember I suggested, Oh, you could play at um, sidewalk cafe. <laughs> on, uh, mm -hmm. uh, on Avenue A because there was a thing sure. I think on Tuesday nights called the the anti folk. It was like okay, it was the that anti folk still there. Yeah, yeah, I think the the venue's still there. And the anti folk, which was which was uh, written by this guy Latch, who now now lives in lives in Edinburgh. Um, he um, and it would be you know it was like an open mic, but it was like folk supposedly anti folk. Although I didn't really quite understand what was anti about it. It just right, like, oh. right, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Like I was like, anti-folk, that sounds good to me. And I'm like, oh, it's folk, yeah. it's still fine. But, you know, I guess something's anti about it. I guess that's good, too. And uh, so she played, I remember she played a 12-string guitar, and then Latch made a joke and said, oh, your uh, ninth string is a little out of tune or something. And everyone laughs because it was a lot of strings to tune. Mm -hmm. And um, and then somehow just kept up the conversation. Uh, she was in this um, film. Uh, Tromeo and Juliet. Tromeo and Juliet, yeah. Yeah. That was kind of amazing that's kind of like what she's most famous for but i love her band the dolls i'm a weirdo yeah i, re I mean i remember they they um they you know it was just a weird time too because so there was uh big label stuff happening you know you know this was the kind of thing where like mm -hmm. that band helmet you know yeah um, we're gonna talk about well, helmet for sure well, you did you did a little trailer of helmet and you played a yeah. song right which i think is cool that song off, off the song of the record betty yeah and betty was on um, a major label and that band got dropped with the record let's I recorded. talk about helmet and then when, when that when the record i i worked on uh they got dropped with they got they got dropped on uh I had that weird feeling. Oh, they got dropped that... after this, really? Yeah, yeah, because it didn't sell oh, enough. Man. It only sold three hundred thousand copies. So you know, so... I I was looking for it. I definitely had this album on cassette back in probably nineteen ninety four or whatever, and I definitely have the Crow soundtrack. Wow. So, yeah, um, um, yeah, it was sad that they got dropped. You know, I felt bad. Maybe it's me. I don't know. No, but, definitely but, not. Because I, dude, I mean, I didn't know. Okay, just to age myself a little bit. When did that album come out? Like 94, maybe? Yeah, Three, maybe. Four. Yeah. Let's say 94. I was 10 years old. So I didn't know about the record sales or give a shit about that. But I knew this record. And to this day, I think it holds up as one of the best, heaviest sounding records I've ever heard. And knowing that you're like, somewhat responsible for that is just like holy shit betty how did how did that happen well yeah i mean well what ha what happened was that they uh they recorded in this studio it was really it's actually kind of funny but uh you know kind of charming in a way that they they wanted to insist that their record was not about rock right that's what they were saying okay. like being. it's not about yeah because he was kind of like a jazz player i think i even saw him play with david bowie once yeah, he, he would talk a lot about like Coltrane and stuff in interviews. So he was mm -hmm. saying, um, you know, we're not it's not about rock. We're not a rock band. This song, this rec this band is about rhythm. 
So mm. they they went to a, a hip hop studio. Right, because it was the um, someone from I want to say Cypress Hill produced it. Yeah, and that person was there, and uh, they used I guess an in house engineer or something happened. Then they completely botched the guitar recording. Mm. Um, and so then in a moment of desperation, then they call me. And um, I should note that that's probably the only notable record that I worked on not here in this in my recording studio. Oh, really? So, it wasn't recorded there? No. no. Okay. So so that's the one. That's the one. So I, I went to, to the studio in Manhattan and uh, I, I looked at how they, cause they, they were still set up with the guitars. It was like emergency. Like I got the call like overnight, you hmm. know, and then, and then I go and it's like, Wow, the 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 like the 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 weren't the pads on the microphones weren't on. Can you imagine how loud those kids? They would have like oh like, yeah like two full stacks of the mic and then no pad, oh. like an AKG with no pad, and it was like completely crapping out. I was just like, wow, this. And so basically, for the that was the main problem. So really, all it took the the reason I got the helmet project was just from a little switch on a microphone, like a little. Wow, yeah. That, problem but i think it's what it was was like it just showed me you know you may think that the record's about this or right about that but if you're gonna have guitars and heavy guitars on it ultimately you need someone that's experienced recording that instrument you know it, it, there's certain limit there's certain simple things like that right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um yeah i mean it's i feel like i had a big part in the record but in a way people comment about the guitars yeah um, and all this all this stuff things lean against each other you know you affect the sound of the guitars it forces the drums to be a certain way for instance so for in the mixing you have to arrange things a certain way so i think did you, you know, mix it at all or no no i just didn't the guitars. So, you know, I, i'm sorry all i recorded was the guitars but on the other hand it's it, it's still even even just having a tiny part in making the sound of that record is just like mind-blowing to me because that just like holds up as one of the best coolest sounding records of all time i think it's timeless Cool. Yeah. Well, they did the. Um, I think they did their twenty the twentieth anniversary tour. I you. saw it at Bowery Ballroom. I and, think. And and then they played all of Betty. Like that was. Yep. I saw and, that and, tour. And Were you there? Based. Was that? Were you there? I think I oh, saw that no. at Bowery Ballroom. No, I wasn't there. Wasn't yeah, there. I did get to see that. It was really cool. Wow, but that that was the thing with business. It's like it was just. I think the business on that level kind of fucked things up. For a lot of people so the dolls the jane jensen and the dolls um mm -hmm. they were hoping to be on a major label and it just um didn't bite and then it was just a, a big crushing experience yeah. which, which it shouldn't have been but they and they were. should have been so famous those songs are so good well people sometimes don't see stuff you know i mean also mm, jane was true. also a, a, a herself was a, a sleeper come up come come up from behind uh mm -hmm. because she released that first record of hers that i had nothing to do with called um comic book uh, horror yeah so she released that was that. on interscope i think yes which wasn't that the same label helmet was on um i believe so yeah yeah so, okay uh, so, so the thing is 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 it wasn't comic book core was not initially on um oh on, they got picked up yeah it got, the whole record got re-released re okay. it was on the on the small label i guess by her manager and I'll her manager all, her manager also oh, she, did she mention that no i'll just look it up <laughs> yeah so so she so uh the manager um the manager also managed wait for it flip, flip records Biscuits. was it flip yes flip okay wow limp biscuit huh so they, i don't know if limp biscuit was coming. on flip but but they had the same manager and okay so uh, so the the man the the manager was really stoked on um on jane and mm -hmm. uh wanted to get them signed yeah they and, were on limp biscuits first yeah they were on flip apparently oh interesting so he mm. um he um i think that i think the name of the manager was jordan he got them um he basically jordan shuts shuts shoot sure jordan sure yeah, yeah. so she she the, um he got he basically negotiated for her to get on Interscope and negotiated that Limp Biscuit would get pulled along, right? So I mean, that's the way I understood it. Which was basically, <laughs> Thank you, Jane. <laughs> was like, Jane was the main attraction. Wow. But you know what? You got to take Limp Biscuit also. Yeah. 
sort of, right, in the negotiations. Uh, by the like, way, another great producer on those records, Ross Robinson. Oh, what? That's the um, Limp Bizkit. On, on, on Limp Bizkit. He, he's, he's the one that did Corn. Is that right? He did Corn, Limp Bizkit, Slipknot, The Cure. Like, wow. Yeah. So that's what happened. Drive in. Oh, right. Okay. And, but then when, when um, I guess when they both got on that label and then they reissued, they reissued uh, Comic, Comic Book Core, Core yeah. which was done very lo fi, you know? Yeah, it's pretty lo fi. Yeah. Yeah. So it's then, pretty DIY uh, but, sounding. But it had a, a, a charm and really hit sure. college radio. Mm -hmm. And then also, I think that the artwork on Comic Book Core had a big part of communicating what Jane was about because it was comics. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. it's funny for being comics, it's sort of like a B rate kind of art, right? And then she ends up on this B rate kind of film thing. With yeah, Trauma. and the cover was half a cover, and then it was just the CD. And so, yeah, that was yeah. like a unique thing too. I've never seen before. Yeah, but so but the business is messed up, and so then then she got e they got eclipsed by Limp Biscuit, and I don't know, just things. <laughs> Damn. Everything it's just got weird. Uh, things are always weird in music, but then sometimes uh, when you inject like this this hanging fruit of of like lots of money potentially and 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 resources and big tour support where you can really do stuff i mean it's it's all very it was a weird time it was a bad time for me in a way it was it was a tough time i mean it, it's almost problems i wish we could have now but yeah mm -hmm, they were mm -hmm. problematic yeah so then how did you uh get i guess Werner, i guess was the, the album that kind of came out of that fire i guess you would say because it was sort of like a little bit left over from the dolls sound but kind of back to diy i guess yeah i think that somehow jane wanted to work with me and then i got along well with her producer craig who was the same right. producer as as on comic book core mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um you know he was also um recording this uh um this band called dirt in, out of cleveland okay. that they were like people on like on like motorbikes they were like kind of it was kind of like mm. new metal okay also. i know i i maybe you've heard of them but i don't i'm not familiar i don't think I, i'm not even sure that came out either you know mm. but then i ended up recording a bit of that the the band from cleveland came and came to the studio and kieran gowanus and um mm -hmm. uh i yeah I, I don't know it's i i think it was just something that clicked for them which is I think as we all communicated very well, that's really what it is, you know? So that, that takes precedence over like little details of like how you approach sound or something. Right. Yeah. And that's a good segue into talking about your studio and how interesting of a sound that it has. Right. And, uh, and do you, you, okay, well, you know, I think this is a good time to uh, play the trailer just to kind of show what it's all about. How, how about that? Sure. All right, cool. We didn't really know what we were doing. I was just a kid with a lot of chutzpah. Back then, nobody went to Brooklyn. They were kind of like pioneers. There was a knowledge that this was going to help a lot of underground people make music. It wasn't even called hip hop, really. It was just this new weird thing that was happening. The collaboration, everyone was on their A game. What Sonic Youth was doing at the time was pretty radically different than what anybody was doing, so we didn't know exactly how to record what we were doing or how to capture it. And it's just a skanky basement, but uh, it just it had sort of naturally decent acoustics. These stairs have actually ended up on a f quite a few records. I love the way drums sound out there. I like it. I like how it sounds. Martin would just let you kind of go haywire in the basement and <laughs> destroy whatever you wanted to. From what was a very small scene of like indie rock, experimentalism, and counterculture, and this really kind of snowballed into something big. To get nominated for a Grammy and to go on stage and perform and then win, there's nothing else to say. I kind of miss those days of chaos. Anyone who's been in this area and made music that mattered at one point connected with this guy over the last 35 years. One of those historical places that can actually generate new inspiring material. So I finally watched the documentary and I can't believe that it 
came out what 2014 because to me yeah. it still feels new i'm like oh yeah that documentary that just came out i gotta watch that and it's almost yeah, been it's, fucking it, 10 years and i'm like what it, the it, hell just it, happened well it feels it feels um it, it yeah it feels new on one level like it feels like a, a, a topic right now but when yeah. i see the, the words 35 it's like wow it's dated because i'm past 40 years now right location. yeah 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 you know and then we did that dot that we did that sort of um uh, BC 35 record right. of like people making new material for the 35 year anniversary. Yeah. And now we're Brian was involved with that too, right? Yes. And then mm -hmm. we, um, we uh, kind of missed BC 40 because mm -hmm. BC 40 would have had to be been recorded. Was that during the pandemic? Yeah, basically. So that, yeah. that didn't happen because that would have been 2020. We would have, we would have had to start recording it in 2020 or 21 mm -hmm. and, it just didn't happen. Then, then, then the vibe was off for me. I didn't feel like celebrating and then doing like a half thing because um the the BC thirty five record we did a whole weekend. That was kind of a celebration. Right. We had a party basically. Well, maybe forty five is the is the number. I thought about it. Some people say, "Yo, just skip it. Just wait to forty five. Then really, boom, boom, boom." Yeah. But then I thought, well, I don't know. Should it just be weird? Call it BC forty two, or how about BC forty plus one, or just but get stupid right. with? I don't know. Yeah, a yeah. lot of ways to think about it it'll happen again at some point but yeah when i see the documentary to see 35 years and people were f flipping out with that like mm -hmm. it got a lot of attention thankfully in the in the new york media like local media just because no just generally even people without even knowing the music just the fact that there was a recording studio that did something that was important to brooklyn that had mm -hmm. been there 35 years or more was like a, a jaw drop like you'd have people on like cable news in suits going 35 years wow crazy like whoop. so it's it's a rare thing really in new york and uh, what's nice about at least well probably anywhere is people want people want their their place to to stand for something right but so then for a minute there i felt like i was right up there with nathan's nathan's hot dogs you know mm -hmm, i mm -hmm. felt like oh uh, coney coney sure. island like the yeah. musical equivalent of like the mermaid parade or uh, yeah that that doesn't sound too uh too far from the mark why not yeah i can get i can i mean i love the mermaid parade so that's why it popped into my yeah head. uh and i just uh, i have another show this is sort of a sidebar but i do another show about just guar and i talked to chuck varga a couple recently and he was the king neptune in, at of coney island and his uh his wife bambi was like miss coney island or whatever for a long time well it's funny in my video there with the neptune thing i didn't think of the king and queen of the mermaid parade yeah uh, yeah he that's him <laughs> yeah i didn't think i think it, well they kind of do that every year like with the, the yeah they have a little chariot and then they have a different king and queen each time right one something time like that agreed. i've only one been time. like once or twice but i don't like that many people and being up that early in the morning so it's always been that's like i really want to go but i also don't want to go there <laughs> well you got you know the best mermaid parades are when it's cloudy yeah sure because then then it, it's still mobbed right it mobbed enough right but then it's it's not the extra million True. people that are going to yeah, the beach yeah. you know because i i don't live there anymore but for about 15 years and when we met i lived in astoria so i was the first stop on the train and coney island was all the way the last stop like a good hour and a half down maybe two hours depending on delays yeah, that that's a that's a, a a buzzkill. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now I just drive there. I was actually at the Freak Bar uh, the other day to see a band, and that was that was fun. To I don't know, Coney Island. It has its own vibe, right? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting to be there at night. By the way, if you've never experienced that, that's something. Well, it's I definitely... the last time I guess I was there at night, I saw the Dresden Dolls play at the amphitheater. Oh, I was there too. Yeah, I was there. That was a great oh, show. Speaking of Amanda and and Neil Gaiman were once the king and queen in the Mermaid Parade. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I, I was there. I did, it was too much. I couldn't, you know. But I saw them like two blocks away on the parade in the chariot. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, okay, right. Yeah, but I maybe, forgot about maybe that. Neil Gaiman had a, had a trident, just like me in the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's a good. So that's a good segue. Um, what? What's the update for, since the documentary? Like the studio is still there. How is Whole Foods? How is um, I guess I'm sure you could probably relate this to the video we saw at the beginning of the show, a storm called Ida. 
Yeah, well, we're we're still trying to fight um, the changes that 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 are being imposed by the city on Gowanus. You know, it's a losing battle. We keep losing, but but gaining time. Spoiler so we, alert for anyone who didn't watch the documentary. But by the way, go watch it. It's on Amazon or whatever you can find it. Um, it kind of ended with like Whole Foods entering the area and kind of starting starting the gentrification process. Is that a good way to put it? Yeah, I mean, part of the whole deal with Whole Foods is that every that actually the city got an, a, an abatement on tax because it was understood that it was Whole Foods was going to increase just its presence was going to increase the property values all around. So uh, property owners got like a little three year abatement to just sort of ease the pain of of, mm. of the taxes being based on like the value the the property values. And uh, it, you know, that was the first Whole Foods. Now, now they're all over Brooklyn, but that was the first one in Brooklyn. So it was a big deal. And basically it was a rebranding of the neighborhood. It's all a, a big plan that it seems like no one really is in charge and it just happens, hmm. but it doesn't just happen. These are all like, you know, backroom deals sort of basically by the real estate board of New York that sort of plans this stuff. And it's always very predictable. They rebrand the neighborhood. And then they they twist around the numbers and they also ig ignore the environmental issues because this is a massively polluted area. We're right next to um, right. one of the most polluted, you know, federal Superfund sites in the United States. So it's it's really serious stuff. It's all the, all of Gowanus as you walk around is, is band-aided. And it, wasn't it kind of just like flowing underneath your building? Yeah, like like the um, I mean, I'm. I'm in part of what's sort of a tidal marsh like under it, but you just never see it. You never see it until, you know, there's things like, like that video in the video, mm -hmm. a storm called Ida that sort of um, hearkened back all the hydrology that's kind of pri primal and like, un because, you know, you can't really stop water and that sort of underlies the whole area. It's, it's at sea level. And uh, just that, that was a massive storm. And then it just doesn't coexist well with human habitation. And then when you add this, like, miasmic soup of 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 legacy industrial pollution it's quite a it's quite a big deal but yeah on that song of mine it was simply that um um you know the city screwed up and um uh d refused to take in the new reality of climate change they kept saying that that storm which was like break broke all kinds of records they said we don't redesign stuff over 200 year storms that's what they said with hurricane ida hmm. You know, because because even the mayor said all the data has to be redone. When he said that, I thought, oh, OK, there we go. He's putting a pause on the rezoning of Gowanus, of my neighborhood of Gowanus, putting a pause until all the data is redone and they figure out the sewage infrastructure and how many. And no, they just pushed it through anyway and said, oh, no, well, that's a 200 year storm. So we don't redesign anything for that. And it's not a, it's a lie. Right. I mean, it's just wait another 15 years and there'll be another one and there'll even be be more higher mm -hmm. rainfall rate, all that kind of stuff. And we also suffered with Sandy, Hurricane Sandy. Mm -hmm. That also brought like a 10-foot storm surge, flooded all kinds, of, uh, destroyed some recording studios. You know, wow. so that was that was 10 years before Ida. And that was, uh, yeah, I mean, my studio became a bit of um, a, uh, a haven for like um, um, damaged recording equipment from that had to be salvaged out of these re like a recording studio nearby mm. and a, a big rehearsal like building with stuff so they had to bring stuff here like out of the sewage out of the water and like dry mm. it out it was really quite a quite an ordeal wow but yeah so we're right we're right but it's the, still there you're still there i'm still and i'm even lucky like everyone gets screwed over and knock on uh knock on a mic stand yeah. i um i mean i'm just in a place i mean the the in that in the the storm collider video the the water for me just came just to the the other end of that wall over there it was like eight feet of water but Jesus. just held back just by miracle it just didn't breach so i just keep squeaking by on like pretty much everything but yeah the studio's here um we still kind of because it's, it's so uh, everything is so wrong on a lot of levels with this stuff with this real this is so, so much money it's worth billions of dollars the rezoning and the housing and it's then they're totally like cutting deals with like developers and stuff um hmm. so you know it's wrong on so many levels and we're fighting on the we're we're fighting on the the stuff that's maybe the most egregious the most egregious problems um the the displacement of artists is not even the most egregious part of it it is to me but um as it's been explained to me it's not illegal to displace musicians or their recording studios so we just 
kind of fight fight the city on the stuff that we see what their Achilles heel is and um, mm-hmm. where they're breaking federal environmental law, for instance, that's where we're at right now. That's, mm. and it is, it's not, we're not, we're not just uh, uh, picking our fight, you know, out of convenience or just trying to be obstructionist, but it, cause it, it's actually really is serious, you know, and people care about mm-hmm. their health in a way, you know, that 40 years ago, people kind of didn't think about it. everyone wants to be healthy. Now it's a different, different world. So people care about being on like, on top of like 150 feet of carcinogenic petroleum products that's like underground that they care about that whereas before maybe they were like well, under a whole foods how ironic is that right well yeah and whole foods <laughs> is one of those spots actually it's really bad but but whole foods is not so bad actually because most of it's a parking lot that's kind of safer right you right, know? right you can and and you can't live there that's why there's a store there but then they're starting to cram like housing anyway i don't want to get too wonky about yeah it. yeah sure um yeah. well i'm glad that the studio is still there that's kind of like you know, because for 2014 to now, like a lot of shit could happen. Like, I'm sure a lot of studios have and venues have been closed down since then, especially during the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, honestly, so, I'm so happy. much. So it's much life, one of my life goals to like come and record something there. Uh, I just never have a band ready. So, but eventually, eventually. Yeah, well, so far, so good. I'm definitely safe for another couple of years, just to say that. Okay, cool. And I think that the reality of of my whole time in, um, in the recordings with the recording, well, really the recording studios made facilitated everything I do has kind of been a a lot of dumb luck. I mean, just the fact Mm. that I even came to this part of go of Brooklyn, that's, you know, a, uh, industrial pollution, you know, kind of, uh, health hellscape, Mm-hmm. Um, just even that, because I, I didn't do it because I was smart. I just did it because right. that's where it was what, right. You know, actually sure. I looked at places in Williamsburg when I first was picking, when I was first picking a studio in 1970. Oh, you could have been so cool. Yeah. But then I would be cool for like five minutes. Or yeah. 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 And I've been, I would have been gone. Exactly. Because it wouldn't have lasted. So I've, I've made a lot of dumb, but correct choices. It's not because I'm right. smart. So that sense might, uh, you know, knock on a music stand. <laughs> Well, that's that's a good. Uh, yeah, let's talk about longevity. Let's talk. Let's go way back. Let's see. What do I have here? Bill Laswell. Uh, you used to do a lot of work with him, especially back then. How did that come together? And, you know, what's what's. Tell me about Bill Laswell. Well, he's responsible for a lot of interesting stuff that I grew up on that I, I really love. Well, that's, that's, that's again, just like this, it's, 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 it's the kind of connecting, I guess that only happens when you're like, you know, high school age and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I was, um, I mean, I met him when I was still in high school and, and he had just moved from Detroit. He was like older than any of us and well-seasoned. I don't think, I'm not even sure he graduated from high school. He, He really lived in musicians, kind of hard knocks life from the beginning. He toured all over the South with like funk bands and stuff like that. So he had a lot of like hardcore, plus he, plus coming from Michigan, he also knew of a whole angle of punk, right? Because um, Iggy, Iggy mm. had a history in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And so, uh, and so Bill didn't grow up far from there. So he got a mix of like, like funk, African-American funk, and then also experience with like listening to Stooges and a lot of other proto-punk in, in Michigan. And then he moved to um, um, Manhattan and then holed up at this studio, at this in this building by this, a, a, a guy that was like a Bulgarian or something, some sort of Eastern European, um, who'd uh, met Pro- Giorgio Gamelski, who had previously managed like the Rolling Stones in Huh. in London and and managed okay. all these like, these psychedelic bands in London like soft machine and stuff like that huh. and so he he owned a building somehow Laswell got in there and then Laswell put uh, an ad in the paper something like in the in the one ads or whatever the personal ads looking for like-minded people must like um you know Stockhausen and, and throbbing gristle or something like huh. that I think that's a mix okay so if you get any of those references you're in yeah i I think it was something like that and then then uh, one of my two friends in high school um who were like in the sort of high school band scene of like playing dances you know it was not and cover music right just just kind of that's that's where the money was right well yeah but i mean these were all Mm -hmm. like 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 there was three of us right so basically Mm -hmm. there's three of us and we all ended up in material eventually and we all ended up that's my next slide 
yeah, we all ended up being immaterial. And we all ended up being producers, right? So it was yeah. me and, and Michael Beinhorn, who was a year older than me. And he ended up uh, producing like Soundgarden, Red Hot Chili Peppers, uh, Corn, actually. So that's okay. Michael Beinhorn. And he was a year older than me. So I, it's funny because I was still... I was still a senior in high school. And then Michael, I don't even know what he was doing. I think he was just like living in my apartment and just not doing anything <laughs> and mm -hmm. just playing around on the synthesizer. And uh, I don't know, that was in. And then his best friend was someone else I hang out, hung out with, who was Fred Marr. And Fred Marr um, later also ended up producing like Lou Reed and playing in the Lou Reed's band. And I think Vitamin C, some some woman Vitamin C, like a Oh, a yeah. But yeah. You, you want a crazy connection here? I don't know if you realize. Do you know Vitamin C? No, I don't. <laughs> okay, well, like, that's so funny that you reference her. What's that? Like, you're talking about the pop singer, right? Yeah, a female, right? By the mistake. Yeah, yeah, like the graduation yeah. song and, and stuff. I don't know. The, I just oh, know okay. that Fred Marr ended up sort of producing her. Okay, so check this out. <laughs> Vitamin C used to be in a band called Eve's Plum. Right. With, with the guy who ended up drumming for World Inferno for a very long time. Oh my God. Yeah. So like the first and like probably the drummer you saw them with the most before Brian, the guy he replaced, um, he was from Eve's Plum. And I think his brother who was in the band married Vitamin C. <laughs> who was well, it's singer. funny that I should, I, I almost felt bad for mentioning it too because I thought that Vitamin C was just, just like odd, like dead end. No, I love this footnote because you know what? Go everyone go, go listen anywhere. to Eve's Plum. They were like an alternative rock band from the 90s. They were more like letters to Cleo than vitamin C, you know. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. So um they uh anyway, so he so anyway, I'm just saying that Fred went on to do these kinds of he ended up being a producer. So we all mm -hmm. were, but the thing that's funny about that is when I was living in a part, my dad had died, so I had died. My parents were had both died. They had both died, and I was sort of an, I was not sort of, I was an orphan. So for about six months, I was a minor about in, in my, I was 18 years old with no parents, but I had an apartment. And um, uh, yeah, so Fred Marr, the vitamin C producer, he um, he was like 14 at the time, but he was like oh, best wow. friends with, with Michael Beinhorn, who was a year older than me. I kept wondering why we were hanging out with a 14-year-old, you know, but... Mm -hmm. You know, just because it was like, well, I was very young, but super nice, and that was fine. And then he's a drummer. And so from this world of um, of just kind of hanging out in, um, like, high school bands in Manhattan, um, and also there was a bit of a, an art scene connection because some, like, some of our friends had, like, gallery own, uh, parents that were gallery owners or something like that. So we had a little bit of a toe in on, like, a little bit of something that's a bit cooler than just what was happening in high school. Mm -hmm. um barely but something and but anyway so the, i remember for um enough know, to Stone know who throbbing gristle was what's that enough to know who throbbing gristle was um yeah so exactly you know and uh and actually michael Beinhorn, the one who's a year old a little one year older than me he um he was very adventurous listening to stuff you know i was listening to kind of basic stuff you know i really liked yes and i, I like the sex pistols hey and, trevor horn <laughs> yeah 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 and i liked um uh, craft work, you know, so it was a little more basic and he was good. He was the Stockhausen person, right? So, um, uh, so anyway, they disappeared for like, for like two weeks. I didn't see those, th those two friends and they had answered the, the ad of Bill Laswell of like, Oh, want to meet like-minded people. You know, I'm paraphrasing something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, so they came back and they said, Oh, we met this great guy, Bill. And, and, uh, we told him about you and he said, he'd like to meet you. Uh, and I think it's well back then I was like in the theater department in high school and I was kind of into doing stage props and I kind of had my eye maybe on like equipment and maybe doing sound or something. I, I actually didn't really know, but I was a little bit in that that zone. Sure. And um, and so the, so I think that Bill was like, oh, yeah, another very young person with some energy and talent to burn for something sure i'll meet him so because he was trying to get he was he's always was always very like productive bill you always want to do shit mm -hmm. and so and, and he uh, was I, very he has been very productive <laughs> yeah and he's been very productive and he was also like just a, a i mean just good social skills too of like mm -hmm. um also good at dealing with like older people because we were just a bunch of kids yeah he seems I, very serious yeah i was just like i was really really a, i was still writing graffiti at that time you know so I was just on the street. So I was just like, and hanging out with kids. And so I was like juvenile. Mm -hmm. And uh, so 
Bill opened up this world of like, actually, when I went to when I went to meet Bill, this meeting where I would, we would meet this kid that was in the theater department in, in high school in the Bronx. When I went mm -hmm. to, down to this building that was owned by Georgia Gomelsky, the guy that 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 uh, used to manage the Rolling Stones and the Soft Machine. When I went to meet Bill in that building uh, on the ground floor in the middle of the day, I opened the door and there was a John Zorn rehearsal. So it was oh, like wow. total, total experimental music. I'd never seen anything like that. Just noise, right? Like, well, you know, noise, but squawky. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that's like, that's something I, I do want to talk about in a little bit. Like, uh, like Naked 15 City. people, like fifteen people, like playing at once, right? So my mind was just utterly blown, right? Because it was like there was something. I think that when I was listening to stuff like Yes, you know, like very pro, like Frank Zappa with all those orchestrations, mm -hmm. my ear was going to something that was sort of, um, kind of a little more complicated and a little noisier and you know so i was just my ear was that was i, I had a, i had an ear for prog in a way mm -hmm. something about this this these sort of like organized improvisations that were very noisy because it was it was a, a john zorn game piece you know we shows right was that um masada no this is way before oh, masada okay. with the game with the game piece it what it is 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 he holds up little uh cards and then the yeah. cards indicate who's to play right, right? so card means you and you and it might give you a genre or something and right. then sometimes there'll be like a, a ninja that he calls up another card and that means that if someone's the ninja then they can play through the various duets and trios that yeah he, he was very so inventive like that yeah so it's 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 organized kind of chaos but sort of conducted directed and uh so that was really up my alley my mind was completely brown but brown blown huh. and um and then I met, um, and then we went on a tour with uh, this band Gong, which was uh, th this this psychedelic band from London, but the, the guy's actually Australian, David Allen. And this was total hippie zone, right? It was like like a, a, hat, a pointy hat with like a moon on it and like the, a beard like this. So I was like, what mm -hmm, the fuck? Mm -hmm. and, and then also, I mean, this was just after the 60s. And even though I was a, a, a little more of a punk and like a graffiti artist, I, I had that there was a little affinity for the sixties. Cause I think when you were at that age, then the sixties sure. looked kind of good. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. people were, gotcha. people were fucking shit up and yeah. getting crazy. And you kind of wondered what happened. Cause it seemed like it all kind of just went away. Um, and also a lot of punks were a little more hippies than we even realized at the time, just cause. Yeah. Yeah. You just, it was hippies, but with a different fashion sense. <laughs> exactly. It was, like, it was like hippies was like tie dye with leather jackets. I mean, and, and right. it really was that. Cause if you went out all down to all the gardens, like the, the the all the gardens on the e in the East Village, it was kind of like that. It was like hippie punks, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know. So, but that's that, that's how I met. So you met Bill. Day. That was the day you met Bill Laswell yeah, and John day. Zorn on the same day. That's uh, same day. That's quite same day. And then quite a day. It. Yeah, I I think that was 1978, and then uh, and then he hooked me up with CBGB because yeah, like he was very and Bill really made connections and he was good with older people. Mm -hmm. And it was a good bridge for us younger people that the, it made the older people trust the youngest people because Bill was sort of in between or something. Mm -hmm. And so he talked um, uh, his friend who was doing sound at CBGB's to show me the ropes because I, I did nice. sort of express an interest. And I thought that that was a way to get involved. And he was like, well, no one's doing sound. Maybe I can do sound. I mean, it was really that simple. It's just, well, right. I can do that. And no one else is doing it. So maybe that should be me. And um, so this person at CB's, Charlie Martin, he... Uh, showed me how a board works and then we went from there and actually it's funny because when i started the studio before i got the board that that i have now which is behind me bef the first board i got was uh, exactly the same board that was at cbgb's just oh, for that perfect. reason yeah. because i'd done the, i'd done work at cbs mm -hmm. and um then when it says well maybe we're going to get some recording equipment i didn't even know if it well maybe let's just get the same board that's at cbs just because what why, why it works for them so so i got the same board and actually if you if um, if you look at the, there's a kind of a photo and you can see it in the documentary of Brian Eno in the studio. Mm -hmm. He's in front of a Soundcraft board, which is like an identical copy to the one that was at CBGB's at the time. Gotcha. But that's the kind of, kind of connection. Oh wow! Yeah. So yeah, man, you should have put John Zone and Brian Eno in a room together and see what games they could play together. Just... Yeah, they probably wouldn't have. <laughs> it would have been interesting. I yeah, I think well, well. The thing with Eno, I don't want to put words in his mouth because yeah, he'll see the show, but I think well, Eno, Eno I, come on, yeah, come on, Brian. So e Eno didn't really love 
it was a discussion sometimes with him when we were with Laswell and you know in the same room and he wasn't a big fan of free jazz mm -hmm. you know so I think that the whole idea right. of like just purely expressive noise you know so maybe Zorn is a little more organized and there was a, an intellectual because you know Eno at the time I think had his cards right right that's what i'm talking about like he, he's got his cards and Zorn, zorn's got his cards maybe so i, I haven't honestly i hadn't thought of that they could have played some fun games together they still could guys this is the until, dream collabo until, yo until, this is this is uh bc 42. we started bc 42 right now um yeah yeah it's a, it, it's apps of course right so uh, i think there's an app for the oblique right. strategy I'm cards sure. but uh yeah so maybe Man, this that's organizing cool. I should look that up or organ organizing chaos maybe is a little bit of Eno's thing, but mm -hmm. right off the bat, the Skronk of like Zornland, I don't know if that was up to Eno's. Skronk is is a good word for him. <laughs> um, well, just to just to wrap this album up, like go watch the documentary, you'll hear about this. But I mean, you ended up what, the first Whitney Houston song ever, something like that. The first, um, I think, single single uh, right uh, was first, with yeah, material first, if anyone first, didn't know that <laughs> that's a story on its own that's, yeah, that's well, a pretty good project to be involved with uh so young i would say yeah well what's, what's also interesting is that that's a cover right it's a, it's a song called memories that's mm. a cover of a soft machine record oh soft so it goes back to the guy the producer i mean yeah, the manager so the soft machine was like like prog psychedelic i mean really nothing like what whitney houston became um, yeah or was so i i hear they're making a movie about her who's gonna play you in it oh i mean <laughs> yeah. we'll see if that even gets mentioned I, I guess they have to mention that song that wouldn't that be interesting if there was like a little two second scene in the studio with like a young you and and laswell <laughs> or whatever Yes, well, yeah, that would Hollywood, be you're listening, right? Come on. <laughs> There's going to be that kind of documentary with like actors playing the, the historical No, it's a biopic. Part. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's what I hear. I mean, they just cast her. I think it's like the news. I don't I don't know. Um, but anyways, let's see. I don't I don't want to get too into this cuz I don't know much that much about it, but you got to mention Herbie Hancock Future Shock. This is what you want a Grammy for, right? Yeah, I mean, the record won a Grammy. I didn't win it. The record but... won a Grammy. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you were involved. And um, I guess my question in, with this is like, hip hop was so new. Do you feel like this album influenced what, you know, how hip hop sounded going forward? Or was it kind of the opposite? Well, there's there's two things. It, it's that, that scratching, turntablism was around. Mm -hmm. It was mainly a live thing. Like, right, like right. When you when you saw it, when I saw turntablism, um, it, well, mostly where, where, when I saw it was at uh, at the big Friday night Friday night shows at the at a, a roller rink in Manhattan called the Roxy, um, which mm -hmm. I think is mentioned mm -hmm. in a few songs here and there. That's kind of a, it was a famous thing. It was like a, the Roxy, isn't that something else now? Well, yeah, I think that that, that word. Is it that uh, there's okay. a few things named that, but okay, and there was a song I actually recorded from for a, a different rapper. I recorded a song called The Roxy about the venue, and it's like the Roxy, mm. Roxy, whatever, but it's about that. So it was a, ro a roller rink, I think it was all ages, and I think it was is the Roxy rink. Webster Hall now, or is that something else? No, 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 no. The, the roller rink called the Roxy. Oh, you mean is West Webster Hall now called the Roxy? No, I think. Ro what was Webster Hall called as a venue back then? I thought I thought it might have well, been the Roxy. The point when it was called, I know it's escaping me. It wasn't Webster Hall. It was the Ritz. The Ritz. Okay, that was a different four-letter word that started with R. That's why I was confused. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the, yeah, the the Roxy was the the roller rink on like West 18th Street and 10th Avenue, like but right around there, and. Um, so I would we would go there. It was incredible, incredible, right? So all, all the all the people from the Bronx, South Bronx would come. There'd be uh, uh, there'd be uh, break dancers and and all the various DJs and MCs and um, that's where I really saw turntablism. So that you know there would yeah. be a DJ that's spinning records and they would do like cuts between you know between the two turntables. I guess they would have like two copies of the same record so they could like. Of rock yeah, back the break and forth. beats, right? Yeah, yeah, in instrumental breakdowns and stuff like that. So that was like just mind blowing technique and how it was done. So that's where I saw turntablism, and I think it was 
not very common on actual recordings. Yeah. So from, I mean, from what I understand, I wasn't there, but when they first started getting hip hop artists in the studio, they just had a backing band, which is not how it was, you know, presented live and raw, like in the streets and in the clubs. And, and I think Rick Rubin says it kind of the same way. It's like, no, I wanted that sound of the turntables. Like that's the sound of hip hop to me. Yeah. So we, we, it just, it, so it was sort of brilliant to take this Her Herbie Hancock track. And um, also the thing with Bill Laswell is he kind of, he said to me that in a way, one of his dreams was to have a instrumental hit. Hmm. Um, he just, that's a know, weird there, dream to have, but sure, go go live your life. Well, Bill. There, well, it had, well, he he was saying there's there is kind of one every ten years or so. There's some instrumental right. song. I think there was a song in the fifties, uh, in the seventies called Frankenstein, right? It was like, oh yeah, uh, Edgar, Edgar Winter. Winter. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that was an instrumental track. So I think I think Bill sort of had this idea that an instrumental tra hit would be kind of a interesting hmm. signpost. So I think he that was on his mind. And so with Herbie, he kind of because um, we had the opportunity luckily to be able to work on rocket without him that's that was the, that's the mm -hmm. little oddity is that we were working it here in this studio right behind me right um, in, in Gohannes, and we um got a chance to put it together without herbie here so it steered it a certain way and then he liked i was actually surprised how minimal it remained because it left the studio mm -hmm. here it left mm -hmm. here and ended up in la and um so bill so laswell went to la with the tapes and was back really fast like four or five days later was back and said, what's well, done? And I think I either heard a, a mix, like a rough or a final mix. I, I can't remember exactly, but when I heard it, I was surprised that it was not that much had been added. You know, a few things had been replaced. I think we had a bit of a keyboard melody or something. And then Herbie, of course, which we wanted anyway, he played that himself. And then there was a few little extra sounds, a couple of little vocal sounds that go, whoop, whoop, whoop. There was a mm -hmm. little something like that. And, couple little bass extras so there's a few little extra things but very very minimal so i think that that he, herbie got sold on the minimalistic aspect of it which is a um actually the rest of the record isn't quite that minimal because yeah that, right yeah yeah and and that's not herbie's history for so so for some reason he went with the flow and kept it minimal which was a hip-hop epic at the time um not not hip-hop these days but then it was <laughs> uh well it's minimal now in a different way maybe <laughs> Yeah, but, but then it was very, yeah, so there was a kind of sparing. And then actually, I think that that song was one of the first songs or the first notable song to really mix acoustic percussion and electronic percussion mm. because people were in a, in a rush, eager to do something purely electronic because mm. that seemed like the most innovative thing. But what's funny, right. what was actually innovative, what was actually one of the most innovative things, things was to mix the two, right? So... On Rocket, you have um, Afro-Cuban percussion, right? You have these like bata drums that are Yoruba, uh, Western African instruments called bata, that are mm -hmm. um, they're, they're they're like sacred drums. So even in Cuba, they're rare, but they're used like in ceremonies, like in Santeria ceremonies. So uh, that's on Rocket. So that's that's hand percussion. So that was rare, like combining like a drum machine with acoustic drums was kind of rare and it was also, also rare of course to make the turntable that we would hear at the roxy playing live to actually make that the feature and actually have like a turntable solo pretty much yeah um Did, so was actually, that this is a nerdy question but would you put that directly into the board or did you put that through a speaker and then mic the speaker i think i went directly to the board i and think this is a random, random question i just thought of but do you have any idea what record is that they are playing sampling oh, on I, I do know it's actually very significant what it what that record is um it, it's um um but yeah like i said it was a rare to have a turntable solo on a record so that's the mm -hmm, other innovation mm -hmm. what that record is it's funny because the, the dj didn't really bring his own vinyl mm. and this was dst who's now called dxt so dst okay yeah which stood for delancey street by the way oh really <laughs> yeah so dst now DXD, uh, he didn't bring vinyl or something. And then I, he just thought that, I mean, I guess that Laswell and Michael Beinhorn, who was had formerly been my roommate in mm -hmm. high school, he, they brought, they brought, um, vinyl and it was very like, you know, um, esoteric stuff. There would be like, uh, Indonesian gamelan, you know, right. stuff like that. Right. <laughs> so it just wasn't working. Right. And it was like, it was, I mean, it was fine, but if we weren't, it wasn't getting to a place like, oh yeah, we got it. This is awesome, right? It just wasn't coming. It didn't come right away. So we're sitting there. And then since I was a little like, 
I don't know, trying to help. I, I saw, I know, like, it's crazy. It was right here, right to my left. The, I just, because I hadn't done that many records at that point, right? Because it was 1982 or 1983. So I'd done a couple dozen. So mm-hmm. they were all mm-hmm. the vinyl, all the all the vinyl, all the, they were just stacked. I had them all here to my left. Oh, so that was something that you had produced pre- previously? Yeah. So That's it was great. it was a record for Fab Five Freddy. Okay. Who was it, later the VJ and is still like a very notable, you know, he's he's also in that film Wild Style. Mm-hmm. And um, so Fab Five Freddy, I did a Fab Five Freddy record. And then uh, I said, well, maybe this. And so I handed it to DST and DST, I think, knows Fab Five. I'm Fab sure, Fab. yeah. It was like, oh, yeah, sure. Or, something, or maybe even knew already what to do. So he kind of goes, he's, you know, puts the needle around. Then he finds the spot at the end of side B. Um, it's the end thing, literally the end note of the of mm. the se- second mm. side B. And this is this is a record, by the way, called Change the Beat. So incredible. <laughs> really. That's so re- funny. Yeah. Really. But I was going to say, like, oh, easy to get the rights to that. But there was no sampling rights back then. Um, it's actually now that song is uh, is considered one of the most sampled in history. Huh. Change the beat by Fat Five. Yeah, Freddy. but back then you didn't like have to pay for samples or get them no, because approved it was, or it wasn't anything. A thing. I, I don't think. I yeah. Mean, there was so first of all, there wasn't that much sampling going on. Yeah, yeah, that wasn't a thing until like the '90s, I think, with like the Beastie Boys and stuff. Well, samplers. I mean, there were like. I mean, um, the the rights to to use them. Right. Well, the thing is, is because not everyone and their mother was was sampling stuff. For instance, the the sampler that um, that uh, Herbie used, uh, Herbie Hancock used was. Um, he had either a Synclavier or a Fairlight. I think a Fairlight. Those are worth like sixty or seventy thousand dollars. So wow. sampling involved like tens of thousands of dollars. Right. And it's funny, and that's why also that's also why I considered a lot of hip hop that I was recording kind of experimental because for me yeah, to do it was for me to do the sampling for to, to, for me to do anything like that. I had to do like weird tricks, weird tricks. I'd have to use tape loops or something. Yeah. To kind of make it seem kind of like a sample like to kind of yeah so, so yeah. it involved a bit of like experimentation in the studio since i couldn't afford the silver bullet of just sampling stuff but anyway right. so um so he so basically the when he scratched he he's also he's also manipulating it because the end of the fat by freddie song um uh it ends with a vocoder voice by itself no drums that says this stuff is really fresh this mm-hmm, stuff mm-hmm. is really fresh like a vocoder synthesizer voice and he's just scratching the word fresh and if you listen to the scratching on rocket, you can kind of hear fresh, fresh, mm-hmm. fresh, 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 fresh. It's like fresh. So, yeah, that's the story about the scratching. And in the original recording of the Fat Pipe Freddy, was that a sample from something else? The fresh no, part? That, no, no, no. That okay. Bill manager. That was Bill's vocal. manager. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, because he, he, it's funny because it was the B side. So the B side, talk about experiment. The B side had a lot of screwing around. In fact, mm-hmm. the, it's, it's funny because if, if you look it up, the A side and the, the record itself was called um, Change the Beat. But the the B side that this was taken uh, from had a, uh, a secondary title, which was Une Sale Histoire, which is mm-hmm. French. And it's because the label was the, the song, the, the, the record, the Fat Five Freddy record was put out on a French label. And, and the French a label owner said, well, can you like, you know, Give us something in French. <laughs> okay, so for like that works. for like for like clubs in Paris or something, you know, something like that. Sure. And so then it was like, okay, so we knew that this French woman, and so who no, I, I'm sorry, no, we knew a French person who's who's uh who's a female partner kind of wanted or studying was kind of wanted to speak French, but didn't speak hmm. wasn't actually a French speaker. So there's like this really uncomfortably awkward French rapping on the B side of of uh, the the Fab Five Freddy record, like really bad, like, like Fab, Fab, Fred, Fab, Fab Freddy de- Detective Privé, but uh, private detective. <laughs> it's really uh, and, and kind of awkward. So but right. we were just That's basically me- messing around, then, and then um, Bill Laswell's uh, manager threw in some like like read from a um, Kurosawa like film. So there's like some Japanese hmm. talking, oh, so much, blah, 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 like that. Just and then of course, why not a vocoder at that point? And so that was the, that's what led to the scratching and rocket. That's funny. Now I want to talk about someone else that you worked with, I guess, at least once, um, who was in sort of that circle with Bill and everyone. But I got to mention some Bootsy. Right? Is this something that you had a part in? Yeah, yeah, I did. Or Yeah, what was uh, 
what was Bootsy like? And did he record there at BC <laughs> Studios? Expect to see a big buttocks in my face. Just yeah, now. yeah. Oh, sorry to to distract Whoa. you like that. Yeah, I get you. <laughs> it is yeah, a little shocking. Was, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, um, but yeah, that was. Um, but you know, they always talked about. I mean, uh, yeah, they always talk about you know, get beast to me, you know, Martin, give us that big booty bass, right? So mm -hmm, that was. Mm -hmm. That's what they talked about. It's like bottom, bottom very base, you know, very base African American kind of kind of ethic. And yeah, I worked with Bootsy, and then um, yeah, he was around. You know, he was around in um, in um, New York, and then he ended up um, um, working with the band I also kind of worked with called Delight. And oh yeah, Groove is in the heart. Yeah, yeah. Groove in the heart. Well, what's funny Wait, about you? Were, did you work on that record? Well, well, here it is. Okay, go ahead. Tell you. <laughs> Just like, um, just like uh, World Inferno, I worked on their demo. Oh wow! Before okay. they were, before they were called Miss Miss Kier, is that her name? Yeah, Lady Miss Kier. Before Lady Ms. Kier. they became Delight, and and wow. actually they were, it wasn't clear like that that they were going to be that kind of band. So the demo was a very different kind of band at the time. Hmm. Dimitri, Jay Dimitri, right? He was in this band called Raging Slab, which was this like like Southern rock band, mm -hmm. like in Manhattan that I didn't even understand how a band like that was in Manhattan even, but Dimitri was in that band. So, so, so it wasn't, he wasn't doing Southern rock, but it wasn't exactly what delight ended up sounding like, but it was delight. And some of those, oh, I got to pull that up <laughs> yeah, while you're talking different. about it. So that, that demo, that demo of, um, of, delight that's another thing that maybe is out there somewhere so if anyone's seeing this yeah i was going to, that was going to be my question is like what do you know if that was ever released anywhere or i don't think it was ever released and i think that they totally changed their sound and yeah. uh, but it's funny they, they came up with the name delight during the recording but then it didn't really um um it didn't really yeah there's d there's dimitri <laughs> yeah i don't want to play the sound i don't want to get in trouble on youtube but uh i know bootsy's in here there he is yeah, so, he, and, uh, so, so and Beavis and Butthead loved this video. Yeah, it was a, it was a smash success. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, also I think that the, it was the, the lo-fi thing because I think that I can do lo-fi, but it's not one of the the real things that I'm I'm seen or really am like mm -hmm. excellent at. It's not something I excel at, I guess. I mean, I can, and I sometimes think think it's the right thing. But I remember Dimitri and Kier even saying to me that they wanted Delight to be a little more lo-fi. You know, mm -hmm. so a little more done in their life. I never really like, thought about them as lo-fi, but um, I guess it is kind yeah. of minimal. Yeah, but it was really funny because they um, yeah, it was all a very that weird stew of New York. Also, the way I understood, right. I understood it is that they they met, um, they met the real Bootsy because they had an unfortunate encounter with a Bootsy impersonator. Really? Yeah. So there was a Bootsy impersonator that befriended Dimitri and Kier. Because Dimitri was, they, they were like, um, Dimitri was DJing at this venue called, um, at this big disco called The World in the East Village. Okay. And uh, and the, the, um, the impersonator kind of befriended them. And then, then there was, there was a theft at, um, at the, ven at the venue, at the, at the disco. Like, so a, a, a woman's handbag got taken. So the woman goes up to Dimitri, oh my God, Boosie stole my handbag. And Dimitri's oh, like, no. what? That doesn't sound like Bootsy. So anyway, so it turned out, long story short, that it was a fake. It was an imp impersonator. And so That's they so actually did this funny. whole they hold they did a whole sting with it. And and uh Bill had already been working with Bootsy a bit. So Bill got involved and they got like they got um Anton Fig, who I guess was the drummer in like the, the David Letterman show. And mm. Uh, they did a sting, like to tell tell him to tell this fake this fake Bootsy that there was going to be a recording session with Carlos Santana or something it was a lie, and said, you know, why don't you come on down? And so he went down there. Then they, he got arrested. But anyways, wow. with the whole with the whole sting, which it it involved the cooperation of the real Bootsy, somehow they they met. That's <laughs> so, so funny. That's so crazy. Yeah, um, that's, at least that's the way I remember it. I'm sorry if I got any little facts. No, that, that, that well, I wouldn't know. How it lives in my brain. Yeah, well, I would love to talk to Bootsy, so Bootsy, come on the show. I wonder how hard that would be to set up, but I'll figure that out. Um, he, okay. I, this is like, he was involved with one of my favorite records ever, um, 
with the Bill's project Praxis. Um, so, and then uh, I guess my one of my questions is, have you talked to Bill lately? I think his studio is moving currently, right? Yeah, and by the way, I might have worked on Prax Praxis. Did you? Maybe. Well, also, here's the thing. Is I mean, Bill, it was definitely Bill, in those circles. I don't know if you're credited on any of them, but I, who, who knows? I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I think that Bill... That was John his... Zorn, Bill as well. Brain, yeah, I know maybe, you worked with Brain not. with the Limbo Maniacs, right? Right. I think that that came um, after my time with Bill. Yeah, but I think it was just a Bill, little bit, yeah. But, um, I, I mean, I worked on some stuff with just Bootsy. Mm -hmm. but, right. Uh, but also, I met Bootsy through Bill, so I don't know what... I, I can't remember. I can't keep. You know why I, I can't? Yeah, because that was cause... that was the super group he put together in like the early '90s. It was Bootsy, Africa Bambata, Brain, um, and Buckethead. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I because I don't think I I recorded Buckethead. But I think Bootsy... I was going to ask that. Did you ever uh, work no, with Buckethead? Because I, I know he's but, very close in the Bill circles. Yeah, but I think that that came slightly after. But I I remember Bootsy being here with Laswell. So. Mm -hmm. um, here's the thing is Bill had so much going on. He was like yeah, recording definitely. every day that sometimes the names have, would have to get shuffled around. So sure. sometimes we, cause we did a thing with Sly and Robbie, you know, the, the, the Jamaican thing. So we'd record a Sly and Robbie record for, um, for Island records. And it was like, it can't be a Sly and Robbie record for some reason. So then it became a material record with Sly and right. Robbie. And then sometimes we did like, there was a ginger Baker record. Um, yeah. where like Ginger was actually playing on what they thought was going to be a Bill Laswell solo record or who knows, maybe it was, yeah. but then it could have a lot of projects. Could, then the, like, then the uh, label says, says, like, whoa, 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 we can't put out a, like we can't put out another solo record. We just did one like this year or so then they, they would have to, it forced them to do it forced them to make, put a different name on it. And then Bootsy yeah. agreed, Bootsy agreed to have it be, a, I'm sorry, not Bootsy, I'm sorry, Ginger Baker agreed to have it be a Ginger Baker solo record just because they couldn't do it, you know. So so we were shuffling the names around um, quite a bit. So yeah. so sometimes he would come up with new names for things that were supposed to be material because it was too many material records. Mm -hmm. So who knows? And I got, and it's all a bit of a flurry to me. Yeah, Praxis was kind of one of those weird projects where he would just, I guess grab a bunch of people and throw them in the studio together and see what kind of shit pops up, you know. And I know John Zorn was involved and Blind Idiot God did some stuff with them. And oh yeah, so here's a here's one I wanted to talk about that's sort of related into that field. Um I think I asked you about this once and you pro were just like, don't remember it that well. I wouldn't be surprised, but the boredoms, this is a crazy fucking record. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, it's really crazy, isn't it? You know. It's, yeah, uh, it's a, it's a. I I don't even know how to describe it. But yeah, well, it's, that's it's not even like they're crazy, like screaming stuff. It's like just odd in different ways. Yeah. Also, it was very experiment. I mean, they they really talk about exploring the space. I mean, they were like, they wanted to put mics in like the weirdest places. They would find some corner that it sounded a certain yeah. way and said, well, why don't you put the mic here facing into the wall? So there was all, <laughs> you know, just stuff that was just way and done pretty fast. Yeah. You know, it was just like, yeah, I think it says I was looking at the credits just before the show and it just says um, recorded October 2nd. At BC Studios, so it was recorded in a day, I guess. Something that I mean, maybe I'm I'm remembering three. Nineteen ninety three, I guessing. Yeah, I remember like three days, but um, yeah, I mean, really fast, and also it had to be fast because it was hard to communicate. Right. You know, yeah. English, so they was, they didn't really speak much English, right? Yeah. So Zorn would come by and translate a little, and then other times I would just be. Yeah, that's way. Also, back then it was like it was hard to. Um, I mean, it's a good place where I had less experience, so there was less rules, and there was also a less of a of a template for how anything was supposed to sound. Yeah, you know? yeah. So no, it's it's a crazy sounding record and very experimental, sort of ambient. It's like I don't even know how to describe it, but if you want to hear something crazy, you guys got to go check out the Boredom's Wow Two. I don't think there was ever a wow one, but this is wow too. 
Yeah, well, thanks for bringing that up because I was always felt like a little proud of it, but it felt like such an anomaly. It's one of those things where it's like I'm proud of it because I I hope it's a hard improve. listen, but like it's really yes. good. <laughs> yeah, but that's, it's really that's the thing. rough. It's, it's not like, very like, musical. Like I would love to think because I know it's special, right? But that, I it's would definitely love to special that that people can appreciate. So it's great to hear that people can appreciate it because it was one of those things I wasn't sure that that people would appreciate. I mean, I did have, I've done some records like that, you know, where it's like, yeah, hold your breath, and sometimes it's well, appreciated years years later. Here's another right? one, like Naked City. I hope I don't get in trouble for showing this, but I, th this is also um, I from the boredoms involved with this too, right? Yes. And um, you recorded this album, Torture Garden? Yes. That must have been interesting, too. Yeah, I mean, everything was... was um... oh, by That's the way, John a Zorn. Quick, and... a, quick, a quick tangent is um, another record that was... It's funny because there was a, the record, a record by this band, Unsane, that right. also was like really pushing sounds to some limits. And uh, it's funny because the I don't the, know if it's the, this one, but I have this one in my slideshow. Yeah, it, it was that one, yes, that one. So what what happened was we sent it to the label, and someone at the label at Matador heard it and thought there was something wrong with the master. <laughs> so we we sent the wrong thing, or something got damaged. And so I, I think I got an email or a call. It's funny, I remember everything now is email. Yeah, I don't know if there's an email back then. I know, but I remember it as an email. But I think that's just weird memory. It probably was a phone right. call. But then the person called and said, oh, what's wrong? The master. And I was like, oh, yikes. I was like scared. Oh, no, we completely fucked up this record, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and it was sort of weird because it was an, a major label interest. That's like Matador slash Atlantic. And Atlantic was picking up some of the some, some of the artists on on Matador and like move, bumping them up to, to Atlantic. So I thought, oh, wow, maybe I fucked up the band because it's, it sounds so weird. And then I was like, oh, sounds bad. You think something happened to the masters? I don't know, huh? I'll have to like look into that or something. I was just like, what the, f I, did, I, was, I was scared actually, right? And then, and then, uh, then she calls me back uh, a few hours later and she said, oh, I, she played it to Gerard Kozloy, who was the, the owner of certain, not, well, more like the president of, of Matador. And um, he's got an ear, that, that, him, that person, Gerard. And he was actually told, he goes, no, that, and without ever knowing the record, he didn't actually, have, he hadn't heard it before. He heard it once or heard a little bit of it and said, no, that's the way it's supposed to sound. And so then everything was clear. But that was a record that I was like, wow, because it was really pushing some sonic limits that were like, and breaking rules and not following other rules. Yeah. But yet, on the other that hand, that was sort was, of like that in that realm of helmet as well. Yeah, sort it's of, weird because right? now you listen to it and I'm like, what What was everyone talking about that? It was just so weird. <laughs> so it's like just, barely it's... listenable. When something's new, you don't know how to process it, you know? The voice is, like, distorted, and it's, like, you know, it's this right. big, and it's run through a little speaker. I mean, whatever the hell we did, and but yet... Pill, you know, was that one of those uh, bands that had to change names, or that, were you involved with that when Bill... With one? Pill, um, Public Image yeah, yeah. Limited? No, yeah. I, had nothing, I had nothing to do with that. That, that was when... Because Bill and I sort of split paths at one point, right. and then there were... A bunch of notable records where he came back to the studio even after we'd split paths, right. and uh, that was um, you because he was starting to get a lot of major label stuff, and it was something I didn't really think about then. Uh, remember, he's older than me, right? Mm -hmm. So I didn't think about it then, but then I started realizing, you know, Bill was probably pretty smart about that because he would come back to me for like little pieces of these incredible records, like Ramones or um, right. Yeah, I have that somewhere in my slideshow. It, yeah, Iggy Pop, where I only recorded Iggy's vocals. Brain you know? drain. Yep. So it 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 was a sort of thing where I think he just wanted to get like a taste of the grime. You know, he mm -hmm. wanted to he wanted to get those because he's he's a bit of an alchemist. He believes in sort of making yeah, things sure. one realm and them sort of uh, expressing in a different realm. So I think he he was trying to get a little alchemy, a little like DIY, you know, uh, industrial. Gowanus Canal alchemy going. What um, what did you do for the Ramones record? Um, oddball songs, like oddball recordings. It was like the last two days of the recording. So it was like a little bit of the free for all, like what's going to be added. They added some samples, mm. some backup vocals. Um, so it was just, I think that that one was less than Iggy. Um, so with Ramones, yeah, it was still like just get, get them in, in here, here somewhere. That, that get them, get, the, um, Get the Ramones in here. Maybe something will come out of it from being in this space. That was fun. It was mm. nice having them here. And then Iggy was a Iggy. whole bunch of, yeah, of just doing his vocals. Okay. 
That's all we did. The music was recorded somewhere else. Yeah. So all I did was so you know this is not usually the there's a reason why I don't hold up hold up those records as like a big part of what I've done because right. I didn't record all of it you know but on the mm -hmm. other hand it is a, a part of the st story and then and Bill Laswell's it's part of the story part. but yeah I think the ones that you were more involved with are probably the ones that I was like hold dear like the Dresden dolls and stuff like that um here's another one I gotta I just have to ask about because did you have any idea what they would become when you did this worked on this record <laughs> did I have any idea what white zombie would become yeah were you like oh there's something here this guy's gonna be real famous well first of all I wasn't this think... like re-recorded like three times or something like that well, well I never think anything I do is gonna be successful but that's any fair Anytime I, I or, or that any of the artists I work with are going to amount to anything in the in the in the, in the commercial realm, um, and anytime I do suspect it, I'm wrong. So it's probably oh yeah, that's, that was another question I was going to ask. Like, probably, what what records do you think, or what artists that you worked with do you think should have had that shine that didn't quite get it? Uh, well, Jane Jensen, it seemed like she didn't really. Have Jane it. Jensen, yeah, that, that that would be one thing. Um, but you know, I, I don't know. There's a oh, a lot of things even in a, in the indie realm that i th i think could have gotten bigger also bands keep evolving you know so um mm -hmm. i mean dresden dolls became actually better especially live after recording with me so like a year right. later because i saw them play during that time you know thought it was thought they were good but then a year later you know i think before they even went on to record their second record then i mm -hmm. saw them at like joe's pub and i was just completely oh, floored. Cool. i yeah, mean that's they a were cool just, place they were just so much better. So people keep evolving. Or even Sonic Youth, you know, I recorded Evolve. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the, and that was before they went on the tour, on the Evol tour. So then I mm -hmm. went to CBGB's to see them coming back from their Evol tour. And th the first thought that crossed my mind was like, oh no, it's, they, they're blowing away the record. Like it's just, it's, and, and luckily the record is considered a classic now, sonically even, mm -hmm. thank God. But compared to what they did on that tour live, I mean, so so bands keep evolving, you know. Um, but with right. uh, with White Zombie, yeah, I, I, I didn't really know it. It didn't really fit. I was surprised it fit as as much as it did in New York City. I mean, this wasn't the successful one. Like this was kind of pre-success yeah. White Zombie. Yeah, but it, even that label, it was a British label, Caroline, that they were on. But it, Caroline was sort had this sort of toehold in like in like very noir. Um, uh, uh, no wave it had a bit of that and the fact that that white zombie actually was playing along with what we would now call noise bands as opposed mm -hmm. to metal bands right so they were playing with metal bands in like in terms of live local shows so to me it was surprising that they they, they seemed like a misfit even for new york city which actually was sort of true because they left new york city they left new york right. city it, it wasn't for them um, but yeah, that record um, also, I, I didn't record the basic tracks like the drums and I didn't record okay. the drums, the drums, but then the bass got redone and there was a lot of conflict. They were really not seeing. Yeah, I read that this album was re-recorded like three times and they still weren't very happy with it. <laughs> yeah, and they, and they, they blame Bill and um, uh, luckily my name hasn't come up, you know, right. Whatever. And uh, I think I think when they really blame well, Martin, get him some press. <laughs> bring it on but i think yeah. that that when i realized I, I actually had a bit made a bit of a faux pas because i ran into rob into rob zombie on the street and he goes well how's it going and then i said uh, well we're doing some mixing and we're taking your vocals and like manipulating it through a little speaker with like bill like like putting his like 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 uh you know right. so running the vocal through a little speaker and then i mic the little speaker and then bill sort of like pushes down on the cone with his thumbs you know so Rob was like that did, sort of became their sound, isn't it? I think, but at the moment that sounded like not the way to go. Right. And, right. and I think that that set a weird tone, but I'm, I was just being transparent. And then I didn't realize till later that maybe because to me it sounded, you know, <laughs> there I thought of them as I didn't realize that they were so like I thought their that their their metal thing, that their connection to metal was sort of like this little sh side shtick. Just like yeah, though they were very experimental back then, or yeah, you the, know, more of a more in the noise scene, I would say, than the heavy metal scene. Yeah, well, the thing is, is that then they 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 uh, so that record was done, and then they got picked up by and check this out, they got they got picked up for um, or potentially picked up 
for some major label by this Geffen, A&R. I think. Right. Yeah, I think so. But there was this major, this um, yeah, there was a, a A&R person called uh, uh, Michael Alago. Michael Alago. Oh yeah, I know Michael. You know? Him? Yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah, he's very interesting, and he. Um, yeah, there's a documentary about him too. Uh, oh. Who the fuck is this? That guy, Mike, the Michael Alago story or whatever. Who's uh, directed by Drew Stone. Wow, amazing! But yeah, so I gotta yeah. check that. Out. But but yeah, yeah so it's he, great. He, he signed Swans, and then he was gonna sign um, White Zombie. At the he time. did sign White Zombie. Yeah, um, yeah, but well, well, the the story. Well, you you see in my mind, like that's where I put White Zombie, which is more like the Swans, less mm-hmm. like that that it's about metal, even though they're obviously yeah. more. I think Michael was just attracted to Rob's energy. I don't think he understood the music as much, but he at least like he still has that vision though. Like he's like there was something there. Yeah. So he. So he. So then. Then. Um. Um. Swans ended up not getting signed. They got signed. They they had previously been signed by Michael by Michael Alago for this other thing that was the Burning World. Okay. Um, That was right. That was previously signed to by Alago, and that record was dropped after a month. Um, and I think that the label actually folded the subsidiary mm-hmm. of the major label. I think it was called Uni, and then that that just got dropped. And then Michael was going to try to try to um, sign Swans a second time. And and at the same moment, they, he was also trying to sign White Zombie. So mm-hmm. this was this is my point. Sorry, it took me a while to get there. My point was is that that Zombie picked Jim Thurwell, you know, Fetus, right? Um, and he worked a lot with him to be the producer of their demo. Okay, because this was this was the days of demo deals, right? Where you, right, where the, the label wanted to hear you a little bit, like in a studio, like a proper studio, but not breaking the budget with a small mm-hmm. budget, and just just to get a sort of an idea. And basically, the reality is, is that they they would run it past program directors at radio stations and say, "Would you play this?" But but they hadn't gone all the way, so they would do this little demo deal, and then they have an option mm-hmm. to to pick it up for like six months or something. Oh, I didn't know about so the fetus the, thing. So, so Fetus produced White Zombie just, um, I think that was the only thing he ever did with them. I mean, the only production mm-hmm. he did for them, which was for the demo. Um, but yeah, so not very metal is my point. And then, right, then I realized, yeah, and that's, I mean, that that makes sense kind of bringing in that industrial edge that Fetus has into their yeah, sound, then, right? It's, it's funny because then I realized it because they kept talking, they kept talking about metal, but then in the end result, when I finally heard um, like the solo Rob Zombie and not White Zombie. When I heard mm-hmm. Rob Zombie. Hellbilly I, Deluxe, yeah. I realized, oh, it kind of went, it actually never really became actual metal, you know? Yeah, it was more like dance music with heavy metal guitars, I guess. Yeah, rhythm it, Yeah, he's got a niche and he, he fills it well. Yeah, and then his voice developed, you know. Um, his Did voice it? Got- <laughs> well, I guess it got a little better, but he, well, he learned, know, well, he learned no how to do things with it, I that? think, more. Well, it's funny because I could see why we would take his voice and run through a little speaker because we, I think it was, it was taken actually in Hellbilly Deluxe. There's a song that he sings through like a toy speaker, and I feel like he did sort of the same thing later on. Uh, maybe, maybe it was a White to, Zombie record. Maybe he came back to it, or maybe it wasn't as outlandish. Um, yeah later as he thought i think i think you and bill were on to something there i think we i think he it, it see i could see it in his face <laughs> that that might i mean it doesn't little... sound great but like when i'm sure once he heard the result maybe that permeated something you know Inception. you know what it was if, if you listen to the voice on that it's like it's going through this like thing and then it sort of morphs and changes it's like oh it's, uh, yes, uh, but yeah, that's it's... that's like what i think of when i think of rob zombie though so did i did a good not a bad white zombie there rob not zombie. a bad white zombie yeah 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 okay wow uh let's see we got white zombie what else do i have here uh i put this up just so i could get sonic youth and lydia lunch at once uh i met lydia once um there's a documentary out about her now too. Yeah, the war's never over, something like that. I don't remember. Unsane helmet. We talked about helmet. Ramones. Blind idiot god. We kind of talked about. I I think they are interesting. I saw them a couple of years ago at uh, Saint Vitus. But it's cool that they're still around. Yeah, I mean they really are around because they um I mean they sometimes uh, work here at the studio, so I still yeah. see. But they don't. They're not called Blind Eddie God anymore. They use. Um, oh really? Right well, the, the the guitar player Andy Hawkins, mm-hmm. he has a project now called um, 
um, Azonic, like A Z O N I C. And um, he, he does stuff here, but he also still works with Laswell. Okay. Um, believe it or not, he still likes with he still works with Laswell. I think just because um, Bill likes a lot of bottom, low end, and I think that somehow that's kind of his specialty. Yeah. <laughs> bl bl blinded God always saw themselves as like hardcore but with much more bottom than hardcore. yeah i mean they kind of have that dub influence like that hardcore but also dub well they would also do the bad brains thing right with where, where right. Like half, half the songs were like dub but then mm -hmm. then if once you go to once you go to dub it's all gonna have a little more bottom than the normal stuff and i sure. think that also a lot of those hardcore records I, i'm sorry i'm sorry don fury but i think it's yeah. some of those i mean i i think don Fury's great except that I don't know. They, I, I respect that there was a sound that was recognizable. I respect it. Sure. I mean, bad. yeah, they didn't. They didn't all sound great. <laughs> but he, hey, he did what he could with the World Inferno Friendship Society. <laughs> well, he had a, a rep but, and an attitude, and that—that's a lot of it, you know. And uh, when he when he had his studio in Coney Island, I mean, it's, yeah, that's where that, the that, Inferno that, recorded. What's that? That's where Inferno recorded. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this I grabbed because i just wanted to mention ram lz is just like such a character and i was lucky enough to see him show up at a buckethead show and do some vocals in his crazy costumes and everything what do you remember about ram lz well it's, it's kind of interesting because i'm working with um someone now who has this band called aliens i know i know aliens with blake sandberg yeah yeah he sandberg. drove me around in his van once you what he what he drove me around in his van once. I used oh, to see I aliens. I used to see aliens play to literally just me in the room and the bartender. Yeah, well, they're still around. I mean, I mean, okay. about not giving up. That's why I, I was actually play. listening to them today, and I didn't even real like think about the connection there. Yeah, it might be the. It might actually be um, something I recorded because I, I recorded two Could songs. Be. I recorded okay. two songs for Blake. Well, Blake. Yeah, I know he was working on the Ram Z album like the before he died, right? Right, and and then these tapes were lost because of the the recording engineer, um, Scott something or other, got into a horrible car accident in oh. Williamsburg. How do you get into a car accident in Williamsburg? But anyway, he did. Ew, people drive crazy in Williamsburg. Well, and it was really bad for. I mean, he ended up like a paraplegic or something. Oh, really, shit. really bad. Man. Yeah, and um, somehow that happened during the RMLC project, and it was hard to get you know, under the circumstances to get the, mm -hmm. the recording back or to get the recordings and he couldn't find them. So it was a bit of was a Was this a before thing. Ram Al Z died? Um, well, I think that that happened. Maybe um, before. Well, the accident and the recording was uh, Ram Al Z was still alive. Okay. And, and uh, yeah, this was years before, but, but actually um, like a few years. But... Mm -hmm. uh, that put the kibosh on that project. I, I'm not really getting the, the timeline right, but basically sure, there's sure, a whole sure. bunch. It's funny. There's a theme in our in our interview here of, of lost recordings. So that's oh. another lost recording of um, Ram L Z. Did you work on that? No, that was just Blake. Okay, just Blake. Yeah, but, yeah. but I was surprised to to hear that Blake had that connection. Well, um, but yeah, here's and the I know uh, I was just going to say the the last album that Perex has put out that Bill put out under the name Praxis started as a Ram LZ solo album as well, I believe. And he's on a bunch of tracks. Yeah, he is on that. I mean, it, it's funny because I was, um, he's someone who um, was in the studio with Bill. And then, you know what struck me? It was, it was kind of notable because Lydia Lunch, uh, and because and she was a partners with Jim Fetus, with Jim Thurwell. That and makes a lot the, of sense, yeah. Yeah, they, they like they never really asked me about rappers that were at the uh -huh. studio, or about anything having to do with Laswell. It felt like a little bit of oil and wet, oil and water. Um, a lot of people called these like more like skilled musicians, musos or something. Uh -huh. So it was like, yeah, was, Lydia Lunch is uh, is is in a whole different realm in her of her own. Yeah, and also she she also I talk about, I mean putting down musos. I don't I'm not sure that Lydia ever did this, but that world sure, sure. that world sort of did. It was still coming from a punk ethic of like oh, yeah. not having show offy chops, right? Show offy chops were not really a, of something that was held in 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 esteem. But um 
So they didn't really ask me about like, so they thought of Bill Laswell as kind of Prague or something. So it, huh. it felt a little like oil and water. So they okay. never asked me. They never really asked me about Bill. But I noticed it was really weird. It stuck in my brain that that um, Lydia asked me about Rem LZ one day. Hmm. And, and maybe I even asked me twice. And then so I was like, oh, weird. Because it was that that world of like no wave and like a little more into, sure. like intellectually driven um, lyrics and stuff. They, they never really asked me about the rappers, but so it stood out and it, it caught my, it, it caught, got my attention. Cause I was like, huh? So something about Rem LZ, who's a rapper, because it seemed like it wasn't really a big. Well, he was sort of in the art world too, right? With like his crazy costumes and stuff. Maybe that's where they found out about it. Maybe but at that, at that point I didn't, but a lot of those rappers also had art. art. Like um, I remember I was, I was looking through some flyers of, of uh, Dance Ateria. Um, it's oh, funny because wow. I was look, I was looking at at old flyers of Dance Interior just online because that was a venue where a lot of people that I worked with played and I sure, loved it's the because it, famous it so in the punk scenes. It had, yeah, but it had so many different genres at the same time because it had three or four floors with different stuff right happening with like a dance floor and then yeah, like a live right. room and a cabaret. Right, room. you could have like punk on one level and then Madonna hanging out on the other level, right? Right. So it would be just this insane night. And so I was looking I'll, at these, I'll, I was oops. looking at these uh, flyers. I'll play this. I'll play this in the background. This is the Paraxis video with uh, Bootsy and Brain and, and there's Ram LZ. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. It really looks incredible. Well, he, well, Ram LZ's costumes were not on that level when I worked with him. Okay. Not that this I is like 1992 him. or some 91. Yeah. Cause I worked, I worked with, with him more like 1980. Okay. It's basically the 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 record was called like Missionaries Moving, mm. something like that, and that's the one I did. And um, but anyway, so the fact that these no waivers were interested in Ram LZ really caught my attention because it made me feel like there was something a bit more nuanced about um, what Ram LZ was doing, maybe a little more poetic. Mm -hmm. Basically, yeah, I mean that makes sense to me. A lot of the other rap stuff was, for me, more interesting in terms of just the instrumentation and the fact that we could be experimental with sounds. But mm -hmm. a lot of it was a little more like party music, basically. Sure. Yeah. And I guess related to all this whole world, I just wanted to bring up the Limbo Maniacs, which is an album I really need to own. But you had something to do with this, too, right? Yeah, that was one of the weird because things. Because that's Brain, for anyone who doesn't know, that was his band like before he got into Praxis and working with Bill, and then eventually he was in Guns N' Roses. Yeah, and he was in uh, Primus, too? or Primus, yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember Brain here, and that's as far as it goes. I can't remember what project yeah. it was. I think it was in that whole chaos where like Bill's working on many yeah records bill before. bill produced this so yeah well also he, he he's like a also bill is a very driving producer he really gets involved like he he tends to get involved almost like in songwriting and stuff like that i think that that's why it wasn't a great fit with white zombie too you mm -hmm. know because like even like even with public image hey with it doesn't PIL, yeah it's not always gonna gel like with well, he, okay. well there was a bit of a conflict there also with with johnny lyden and and um and <laughs> isn't Bill. there always <laughs> i bet yeah i mean to imagine those two personalities oh but, god um, no but bill th there's that fabulous song on the 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 pil album record the one that's called album that's album. yeah yeah that's because that's the one he really was involved with and yeah, the, yeah the there's really like a studio project and uh, steve Vai, i think ginger baker played drums yeah like that's that opening track is fantastic and so that's the kind of that's Bill as a producer. So he's like behind right. the scenes, but he makes the whole thing. So when the more someone, the more something is a set band, the more trouble he has, or or sometimes that undermines. Makes, that makes sense. Yeah, you know, yeah, he, yeah. he used to be a little bit of the ilk of like fire. Whoever in the band isn't cutting it, so it wasn't really a mm. long range view of like what the because the band still has the record is only as yeah. good as the band can continue making it live after the record sure. recorded. Right. You know, so it's funny because I'm always very cognizant of like, because I know a lot of stress goes into albums, into album making financial stress and communication. And some bands don't actually just don't communicate very well. And I'm always, yeah, the Ramones probably. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's common, very, very common. Um, you know, even Dresden dolls had played half of it. Yeah, yeah, they, they, sure. yeah, they they had their their friction, but I'm always mm. concerned of like just making it to the end of the project without the band breaking up. So I'm always trying to like just be careful 
with a lot of things, make sure everyone's heard, you know, like, like, I, I don't I, like not pick sides, mm -hmm. you know, not be like, oh, yeah, we're communicating. So we're like leaving out these other voices that would like to say something about what we're doing on the record, but somehow get ignored. And, and maybe those are the people that more often get ignored in that band. So um, really trying to make sure that doesn't happen. And so I think I think with Bill, that was a bit more of a of a maverick kind of producer where maybe it's like a hard knocks and you just make the best record as possible despite the yeah. band. He did that. Right, did yeah. That I mean, Warner. Bill, he literally created the band for that record. Yeah, and, and he also did a lot of... Um, um, with a lot of the the cooperation of Michael Girard, that that record, the Swans record, he really redid that. But but uh, Girard was sort of available to reimagining the band. Mm -hmm. um, but then in the end, so he let himself open to that. Like they were on the same page. Bill Laswell and Girard were on the same page of okay, we're gonna break it open to you know using these kinds of instruments, like maybe Middle Eastern instruments and stuff like that. But once it went there, then. Um, yeah, Michael felt left out of the making of his own record. Uh -huh. And that's why Michael s still speaks badly about that record. I mean, I think it's a good record. Yeah, I'm not as well versed in the Swans. I really need to dive into that. I know a lot of people are really into them. And I know you worked with them extensively. Well, I worked in, it's funny because my introduction to, the, the Swans were always like in the background for me. Like I was aware mm -hmm. of them. You know, I, I found them a little intimidating. They were, um, uh, I, I just didn't think I'd be working with them. You know, there was just a band. I don't work with everyone. So I was like, okay, right. but. Um, you work I'd with say, a lot of people though. <laughs> what's that? You end up working with a lot of people. Yeah, but it's funny. It's it's really very very obvious to me that even in, within the New York scene, or there's just mm -hmm. little clicks and stuff or little zones that I just don't ever touch. And that's sure. to be expected. Also, I don't really try to break into every little facet of the scene. Right. Um, also for one reason is because I, I, I never... I've never once, which is common, we, weirdly common with recording engineers and producers to try to like get a band, solicit a band to work with them and like try to get them to stop working with who they're working with and to mm. work with them. I never do that. You know, yeah, I, I see never, what comes I, to you, right? I, I never, I never badmouth other engineers uh, to a band. Like I never say, oh, you know what? They're not doing right for you. You should come to me. Like, I never do that. I never try to take, even though it's not work, work, I, I never try to take work from someone. Um, I never try to break up relationships, you know, sure, if, they, sure. if they have a thing with that recording engineer, it's, yeah, be, I, maybe I'm interested in that band, but I'm not going to like be proactive. Um, right. I don't know what we got into that topic. Yeah, um, I don't know. Yeah. Sorry. We'll, we'll start, we'll start landing this plane. I know I've kept you a couple, couple hours now. I, I definitely, I don't think you were involved with the album itself, but I just wanted to bring this up because I thought it was fun. And I actually really love this band. I think he just did some remixes, but EMF yeah i i that, did some... those albums are fucking brilliant this band like people need to revisit emf and give them more credit than than i yeah, think they it's... get well basically we it was me and jim thurwell mm -hmm. so um so fetus yeah 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 so it was uh it was we mixed the second single or something so the first single was unbelievable right? unbelievable oh yeah yeah Right. And the so big, the, the song, big one the, hit wonder. And the second song the single, the one that we worked on was I Believe. So it's yeah. a nice song. Right? My and, God, um, it's such a good record. Yeah, everyone needs to go listen to the EMF. And their second record too is even more a little, a little harder edged industrial sounding. But it was amazing having them here in New I, I can't remember what else we did. I think we did a few, but I do remember the song um, that you just showed the cover of the I, Be I Believe. And um, they were Great nice. Great song. They were cool to have in New York City. One thing that surprised me. Oh, were me, they actually there? Yeah. I mean, we I think we were just mixing pre-recorded stuff, but for Yeah, I think it was just remixing stuff, but Yeah, but but I remember that the person from EMF being here like like a while because we were we were starting to go out. So we we would like go to stuff. And I remember mm -hmm. we would go to um because it was kind of a, a bit of a hip situation um was we'd go to Max Fish on um on, like, I remember love, that bar. Yeah, uh, is that still to, there? Um, well, there was a sort of remaking of Ma okay. Max Fish further down near Delancey Street. Yeah, I've definitely been really drunk in that bar before. <laughs> well, it was, it was amazing because it was it was a weird bar because it was a very bright bar. That's one thing I remember. Yeah, but it was very punk rock and like you'd go there at midnight. Skaters like the skater crowd would would go like there. Bright lights it was like being in a, in a high school cafeteria. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
so it actually really lent itself to people like meeting and talking and mm. it was and th since there wasn't anything like that it was almost pushing pushing towards after hours but there was nothing else around there so so it actually drew people from wide different parts of the scene and different scenes they so probably really... did do after hours actually <laughs> what's that they probably did do some after hours actually yeah i think that they a lot of people went from there to this other place called save the robots which was on oh there. i was gonna say kgb but maybe okay. i shouldn't yeah kgb bar right that's on like sixth street or something that's still there yeah yeah yep yep yeah but um yeah, so I remember we would go down to Max Fist with the EMF people or, or the EMF person, one of them. Right. At least. And there was a band that was playing there, like I think every every Monday called uh, Railroad Jerk, which was kind of like, uh, which I ended up recording myself. They ended up on Matador too. And they mm -hmm. were totally, totally like like pots and pans. They were like, like the drumming was like literally pots and pans, partly because to play in the back of Max Fish, you couldn't be that loud because it's a freaking bar. Right. I don't re remember ever seeing bands there, but I guess yeah. But they would they would they do it on the do off it. night. That's why it was a Monday night. Mm -hmm. So it would be a Monday night when there would be less people, but then it would fill the bar because people mm -hmm. liked Railroad Jerk. So I think, and then the, it was hmm. just very unusual that they um, the EMF really loved Railroad Jerk, and I think tried to get Mars. Marcellus Hall, the, the person from Railroad Jerk, to do stuff for them or whatever, because it was pots and pans, right? right? Uh, like for percussion, and then it was like voice. There was no PA there, so it was voice going through like a little amplifier that was like this big. So it was like distorted vocals with a bit of a, a rootsy kind of flair, and okay. uh, very th that band specifically was very popular with like the John Spencer crowd, like John Spencer Blues Explosion mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, Pussy Galore. Like it had. Like John, John, like either John Spencer X. Yeah, it's kind of like a bluesy um, bass. Yeah, so I think so. I think John Spencer actually even played some of those Monday nights doing something. So, but I remember the guy. I was impressed that the the because I thought the EM, EMF was sort of like disco, to, to, just to put it to put it sure. like generally. Yeah, that's so that's yeah. what I thought. Like pop disco. I, I didn't really understand why they were called the Mozarts of punk, but hey. they're actually pretty punky. Yeah. Yeah, I just with with that song, I didn't really. I just didn't catch it or what I also didn't really care. People call things right. all kinds of stuff. And I thought I also some of those things are like markers. Like if someone says something's punk, I, I, I take it seriously. I mean, there's times people sure. say, oh, this, this or this is that. And I listen and I'm working. on. I'm like, wow, it's, I'm just I wouldn't have said that that's what it was. But then I think about yeah, it, like World Inferno. <laughs> but but, you know, that's part of the conversation. So I'm, I'm used to stuff, people describing their music and I'm hearing that it's coming off differently. And I do try to incorporate what they're saying. So if they're saying that they want that, there's no, you know, I don't fight it. It's like, well, okay, well maybe there's something more punk about it, you know? Um, but I remember that was a bit of like, cause I was, I had a hard time exact me, I had a hard time exactly seeing what was punk about EMF and at least, at least in that recording. Mm -hmm. But so maybe yeah, I tried the recording's to... not very punk, but I think them as a band, they were more, a lot more punk rock than, then their pop appeal uh lend right. itself <laughs> right because because um yeah so they um um i mean that song was yeah. everywhere unbelievable yeah yeah well also it's funny because i i was by coincidence i was out west and uh, i heard that they were playing in mexico uh, that emf was playing in mexico in tijuana okay um so i actually crossed over the border and went to see emf in tijuana nice and they were um they opened up or or whatever played the double a bill with pop will eat itself oh wow okay yeah yeah clint mansell so I, I saw both those bands and uh I've, i saw a revival of pop will eat itself but he wasn't involved anymore uh-huh you know, yeah I he's, mean, that, he's I busy doing like big movie scores and stuff now i mean i kind of heard the band a bit and then i saw them so i've seen pop pop will eat itself with yeah he band. does all the darren aronofsky movie scores now and all that stuff Oh, wow, interesting. Yeah, Clint Mansell, he, he, ha he has quite a career for himself um, past that band. And they were on um, Trent Reznor's label for a little bit, too. Huh. Well, yeah, Nothing you, Records. You, you really know, you really, you really know. The I know a lot about a little, and a little bit about a lot. <laughs> right, yeah, well, well, that's a lot of detail to remember. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. Um, thank you, and, and likewise you're a wealth of information and experience yeah, I mean, i've forgotten so much though on the other hand it's kind of sad but but it, but i do get uh, memories do get conjured up like when i talk sometimes i'm like oh i remember you know 
it'll pop back in. It'll Ich bin ein Auslander, yep, yep. What's that? Ich bin ein Auslander. That was their big song in the 90s. Uh -huh. Populate itself. Right, um, right. Yeah, here's a question. I... Yeah. For all of us DIY musicians, what is your best mixing advice? Oh, so I think a key, um, I think a, a big part of mixing, strangely enough, is balance. And sometimes people don't really have a good sense of that. And it takes a little mm -hmm. bit of perspective. I also think that sometimes people's sense of balance can balance can be skewed. Like I, I think if you're a, let's say you're a touring musician and you're playing, you know, 200 shows a, a year, your sense of balance in music might actually be skewed because you're playing behind the drum kit. Mm -hmm. And then you have like the bass blasting and then maybe some other things aren't even loud because they're kind of like not the main thing you need to hear. So you're hearing that over and over and over every night. And that's going to mess up, I think, your sense of interesting. Of yeah, I never thought you know? about that. Um, like so. So, for instance, of how like carving out space for another thing and sometimes it's really just simple as level a little bit of EQing. that's that's mm -hmm. a big part of mixing is simply just like kind of levels or maybe a bit of panning but that's to do with with balance and and panning does affect level right because something can be a little something can seem a little louder if it's off off to the side mm -hmm. um also to have a good sense of panning um i'm um what do you do with guitars? Do you, do you, with punk rock, would you say hard right, hard left guitars or something more in the middle? Well, it really depends. I mean, here's the thing is I'm, I'm medium sensitive to panning. The people that are really in love with big panning, right, that really love like this all the way over here, this all the way over mm -hmm. that, and they say they love panning, and that's fine. They're actually not sensitive to panning. What I mean by sensitive is like like if you're sore, you go, oh, 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 ow, oh, ow. Oh. Like when you deal with someone that's sensitive to panning, I've had people in the studio that put on the headphones and if the panning's off, it's very disturbing for them. Um, you know, I was working with someone and we, and there was like two elements here that were kind of right and left. And the, this person was very uncomfortable about that because hmm. it just wasn't centered. And then finally something comes in in the middle and then she goes, well, then now it's feeling balanced. And one thing I learned with that was like, wow, when someone is not, um happy with panning if someone if someone's very sensitive to panning they're going to be much more uh badly impacted by the panning uh, or by uh, aggressive panning than the person who loves it who's just kind of not that it doesn't phase mm -hmm. them so i think you got to consider that so panning can be um so it depends on the hurting. artist as well what's that yeah so it depends on the artist as well. It depends on the artist. It depends on the ears. I, I usually favor thinking that it's not really up a lot of people's alleys and it's just not worth it. But panning can be very useful too. So sometimes I really employ it um, to, to space things out, to make things sound a little bigger. Also, sometimes if I really need something to stand out, also factoring, how, also factoring in how long it lasts. Like I might take a thing. I said, look, I think Phil, we really need to have this come in. It's just a backup vocal, but it, we don't want it that loud. But I want everyone to get it. So maybe I mm -hmm. will put mm -hmm. pull it out, put it, and maybe I will put it all to one side. But if I do something like that, it, you you might notice that it's just for thirty seconds. It's just for the chorus right. or in the break. Right. But it's not something I would do for the the whole five minutes of the song because it's just too much. Imagine putting your hand under like steaming hot water. You can get away with it for 30 seconds. But after mm -hmm. that, it's like, come on, give me a break. Right. So mm -hmm. you have to be sensitive to that. So so balance, being sensitive or careful with panning. Sometimes I think, uh, too, that if let's say you let's say you have vocals and I want people to really pay attention to the vocals and there's a lot of incidental stuff, which is cool. But for instance, I might be leery of putting it all the way off, off to the sides because I feel it's distracting people from what's in the center. So I might want to make it more, the panning, not as extreme because then it, it doesn't distract the listener from the thing that's happening in the middle. And that's the voice. So that's the kind of stuff that I think it's, it's, it's easy for people to lose their objectivity on. And there's so, like for instance, just stuff like, one thing I've noticed that if I take care of S's, like in the lead voice, Mm -hmm. I do a lot of, sometimes, it, sometimes I'm DS, I put a DSer on, it mm -hmm. still needs more DSing. I'm doing it manually, like automating the S's down, painting in the T's. Mm. Sometimes people will listen to me do that and will go, hey, what, what are you doing? The mix sounds so much better. I'm like, all I did was control the S's. And it's mm. because those things are so sharp and, and it's hard yeah. to really, 
it's hard to recognize actually how loud they are. Like for that moment, that S might be the loudest thing in the mix. So of course it messes everything up. And as soon as you control that, everything has more life, you know? So mm -hmm. that's not, that's not an effect. That's just simple, like balance of level, like what's too loud. Like if this needs to be bigger, should I bring this down? So I do tend to think also reductively. And I like to remind people that that's why we call it balance. So when you adjust balance. Yeah, yeah. You balance it, it and then and then the mastering can bring it back up later. Well, that's the thing is to not worry about bringing things down because actually mastering mastering does sort of you unify things that. That yeah. and make it louder. So it's perfectly fine to bring things down so really i mean first of all I'm, I'm not that disciplined i'd say that a mix with me is maybe 60 percent um bringing things up so it's a little bit of a bias towards making something stronger than than taking other things down but you'll notice it's not like 90 percent bringing things up right with some people mm -hmm. that's all they do is mm -hmm. bring things up right and uh, that's right. the fader chase but that's a way of thinking if you're only bringing things up then you're you're not really thinking about balance of like how one level is affecting the other thing, you know? So, so it's, and it's, the reason is, is that there's something kind of almost a, a something unnatural about how we listen to mu music on speakers, um, you know, or even with headphones and panning, like, let's mm -hmm. say you have two things panned hard, right and left. How often do you really hear that? You know, like, it, it seems like it's a visual, like, oh, well, well be like looking at a stage. Yeah. But, right, but it's, but it's never like to, to be in a situation with that. Yeah, but stage mixes are usually in mono, anyways. Yeah, but you could at least visually see well, the viola plays over here and the bassoons over there, so you, you might get a sense of a stage. But mm -hmm. it's never to, to actually, you would have to be almost in the round with musicians, you would almost have to have like the guitar like only here, but you're just looking forward, right? And the other guitar only here, but you're still looking forward. So you got to be careful with that stuff. But also, something like helmet is, is amazing because. Uh, what you have is uh, the two guitars are complementary. Like they, they do a lot mm -hmm. of panning, right? So, the, and I like it with them, but the guitars are kind of doing the same thing, right? So it's actually yeah. a, it's wide, but it's unified and sort of centered. It's very centered, even though it's not mono. See, I was let me let me see how what do you think of this? Because I actually I went to audio engineering school for two years, um, and then I transferred out to somewhere else. But one of the first things that my teacher taught us, and they came from like a sort of punk hardcore background. They were like two guitars kind of doing the same thing, like in the helmet uh, example you were talking about. They were like, pan it hard right, hard left. How do you feel about that? Is that accurate? Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. I do like it. Yeah. yeah the, more, the, the more similar they are, the, the, the more it works. I mean, if they're, let, let's say one is really bright and one is not. Mm -hmm. that doesn't work well like hard right, right and left. they have to be very similar right because um, because your ear when it hears things right and left it kind of wants to hear a certain e equalness mm -hmm. like they're supposed to be co-equals in a way you know so sometimes when people take two things they say, well maybe we should spread them out um it's like but then we might get into the thing where we're going to have to push up one of the two things so it's kind of equal to the thing on the other side yeah because the yeah. ear will hear them sort of balanced or because you know you don't want to be craning your neck this way so um i mean i would be uncomfortable with that like say with your instructors saying that as a rule because who knows right you know well, i don't know if it was a rule so much but it's like something notable that i took away from that well, you can like, kind oh, of do. Okay. I mean, also the the helmet sound it's really incredible that even then it brings the center is all drums bass and everything and vocals and then the guitars are just kind of like the anchor and the and the sides i guess yeah well well well, well here's the thing is is that that sound um helmet really had a massive in before i even worked with them it had a massive impact on i think indie mixing oh, and recording yeah. and sometimes when i would record um just a one guitar band one guitar situation i would i started getting into recording like the the one guitar coming out of th two amplifiers at the same time right right usually co-equal not like clean and distorted but more like both distorted or both mm -hmm. clean but just a little different it's a different tone sure. slightly. Yeah, that's similar. Or, yeah. Or just two two mics, even on the same thing, and just being very careful about the mic choice and the placements. So you don't get too much phasing. And then mm. I would take those things and put them hard right and left because right. I, that makes I could, sense. Because I I needed somehow to not be 
so blatantly mono, really just compared to Helmet. And that was uh-huh. all about Helmet. So as soon as Helmet like blew onto the scene with the hard, it was basically that was the first time I heard it, like hard pan guitars through the whole thing. Yeah, but, and that's probably what started that whole kind of trend of uh, that kind of did. mixing. But I, I also yeah. tend to employ like like a blowing thing because also I am pretty '90s in a lot of ways, and I like dynamics, mm-hmm. which means mm-hmm. that I um in liking dynamics means I like some sections just coming in with a lot more power than the thing before it or opening sure. up or something like that. So it, it can be getting louder or denser or sometimes even wider. So something can or like come in. maybe turn on those room mics on the drums in the chorus or something like that. Yeah. Or, or more of the room mics on the chorus or mm-hmm. like sometimes a uh, double the guitar in the chorus, but not in the verse. Mm-hmm. All right. this, all this talk, what we just said is very nineties. It, it yeah. seems like, well, I'm rooted in the nineties music too. So that I'm, I'm there with you. I'm pretty '90s, and but the thing is, is that that a, a lot of this stuff just lost its uh, its appeal, like really in the two in the aughts, a little afterwards. And I would say generally that that dynamics got less appealing. Dynamics in and of itself used to just kind of blow people's minds. I mean, I used to. Oh yeah, everything's pretty much flat now. <laughs> yeah, I used to um sometimes meet a band, and all we talked about was dynamics. It's crazy. Like we would sit there, and they would be like, "Can you?" do that sort of thing where shit just kind of comes comes in pummeling and then just sort of yeah that's that loud quiet loud that pixies kind of thing and and um they uh first of all because it was the fact that that would happen that we we're sitting here for half an hour talking about yeah that kind of <laughs> dynamics shows you that it wasn't that easy mm-hmm. like like people didn't really see exactly how to do it and then there, there were some some records that had impressive dynamics i don't completely understand like even even um even Limp Biscuit, you know, the, the Nookie mm-hmm. song, right? Like that, that one. Yeah, sure. It's actually, That's a perfect example. Yeah. It, it's actually very impressive in terms of, uh, um, in terms of mastering because it, the, the, the verses have this one quality and it's loud as shit. And then the chorus comes in and yeah. it slams, but mm-hmm. the whole thing is loud. So it's probably all even. Right. So there's some, there's some, and that's by the way, mastering. So whatever mastering yeah. happens there, just, and, you know, combined with mixing, but the, the the cherry at the on the top of the the, the ice cream sundae with milk with a uh, with limp biscuit um mm-hmm. definitely was in the mastering just to make that sort of thing it probably was also dynamics um horizontally not just vertically right so panning it just also gets wider mm-hmm. um yeah. and just brings in all kinds of new frequencies and takes out other frequencies so it's like but yeah that sure. was a big part of the appeal of that song yeah that's very that was 90s right limp biscuit yeah 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 but, yeah, so um, then that's just no one cares about dynamics now. The kids. Yeah, uh, music became over compressed. Do you agree with that? Uh, um, I wouldn't. I, I don't know. I don't know about over compressed. You know, I'm not saying that I like the way it sounds, but uh, generally, I'm impressed by how much compression there is, and I'm not particularly eager to replicate that. Mm-hmm. And I also don't think it's necessary because so much of the plat, so many of the platforms do the compression for you. And um, also, it's much easier for people to change the volume of what they're listening to because they're usually doing it on a handheld device. It just mm-hmm, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. People will yeah, go, "Oh, I'm true. not going. I'm not impressed by this because it's not loud." They, they just put it wherever they want to put it, you know. And then the platforms mm-hmm. deliver it to you, deliver de- deliver it to the listener, and there's not a, a volume issue. So the volume wars seem kind of over, um, mm. and almost a question in some ways, especially if you if you're going to vinyl. The question almost is how low is acceptable like how low can mm. you have it that's almost mm. a better question not how loud and how can we make it louder it's like how low would be okay because if you have it lower um it kind of sounds better uh it's the the vinyl actually um lasts longer right because very hot records they they wear out mm. faster um, oh i but, never yeah i never even thought about that and there's a reason why mastering engineers for vinyl apply less compression and the reason right. is is because they expect that vinyl is going to be a longer listen right so someone's going to listen to 45 minutes of music mm-hmm. and um, it's known that compression is fatiguing because the mm. compression just creates it, it gives you too much information because no piece of information is lost and your right. brain is still processed this this, this, this this there's some neurological limits in what we're talking about so uh-huh. Um, over compression is just it's just like how some photographers say that if you have too much resolution it can kind of hurt um sure it can kind of 
also be fatiguing on the eye. Too much resolution, mm -hmm. too much, too much clarity. You know, it'd be like all the time having like freaking binoculars on or something, right? Right. You know, How do you handle low end guitar tone with bass? Oh, that's your question. That's a question. Okay. Um, well, I used to not care so much and then i also made a lot of records that were willfully a bit muddy and i worked with people that actually were proud of having muddy some mud like mud was seen as good and i still yeah. think i'm a little bit there because i do like shadows you know i like shadows and i like fog so i'm i'm a perfect shoegaze producer now mm. and um, mm. um but then Lately, you know, because I'm always changing, backing up a little bit, tweaking a little bit. And lately I've been getting a, a little bit more into looking at certain sounds and saying to myself, you know, they don't just don't need a lot of bottom, you know. So, mm -hmm. like, for instance, guitar, for instance, I'll be like, really, does that clean guitar really need anything under 80 hertz? Mm -hmm. Maybe not, you know, but there's something there. And maybe I can get away with trimming it back a little bit. And so I, yeah. I tend to maybe just raise you know, a little tiny uh, frequency here and there. So I've been kind of into trying to be a bit more careful with the low end, if that answers the question. And uh, like, if it's not really needed on, but, but that's almost getting kind of old school. Like I'm actually going back with that thinking, I'm going back to classic engineering, which was kind of classic engineering. The way I think of it is, um, is seventies. That's, that's mm -hmm. when the, you had the classic era and there was, they're very into bracketing, right? So it's like, well, this sound should be in this frequency range because and they had a limited number of tracks. Now we can just put a million things in there at once. Well, you know, the one thing that, that blew all that out is was uh, having bright bass. Because once you start adding bright bass, then how are you going to bracket the bass? Because it's distorted or something like this. People, people used to bracket the bass, meaning the bass doesn't have any frequencies above a certain mm -hmm. frequency. And then the guitar, like they would have a Telecaster right. guitar, it has nothing below something. So everything was bracketed, highly separated in its own frequency range in like these little ranges. And then mm. the, then bass started getting distorted. So that blew it out. And then guitar started having more low end. Mm. So, and, you know, and then uh, things be becoming ambiguous, like wanting ambiguous low end. Yeah. Then you get Tool who wanted guitars that sounded like basses and basses that sounded like guitars, right? And that was right. sort of and in then, that helmet then, realm of things, I would say. Yeah, and then tuned down, and then yeah, hip hop yeah. came, came along, and so so the whole idea. Of and then you get Limp Biscuit, yeah. <laughs> the whole idea of bracketing was it kind of went out the window, but but funny now I'm actually thinking a bit about it a little more, particularly on the low end, because it's like realistically, does it really need, you know? And it does seem like even though with mastering the results that come out of the studio, I'm I'm always happy with, and people are always happy, especially if I'm if I'm shepherding it through the mastering process. Um, but then I realized, and a lot of the mastering, the the mastering engineer who I like, Fred Kavorkin, he is fighting the mud a little bit. And I realized, you know what? Maybe I should embrace the mud up a little. And then because I, I could tell him that at the mastering session, I can see he's, he he would he finds a way to sharpen up the bottom, you know, mm. or give the bottom more punch or something like that. So he's trying to mitigate some of the mud down there. And I'm so I'm learning. Well, maybe I can. Maybe I should be thinking about it more too. Gotcha. Do you have a preferred? format of music like you were talking about vinyl and, and now cassettes are are back which i wanted to show uh, one of your recent cassettes here as well well oh, how do you wow. feel about that <laughs> um well i'm th I, first of all i love cassettes i think they're cute you're right yeah yeah aesthetically they're nice but there's i don't the, know if they're the, the best cutest, quality like every time i look at a cassette i'm like damn that is cute especially yeah that's happens. why i was i was disappointed i couldn't find my betty cassette maybe my brother who's in the chat has it um it might have been his but i um, know i had betty on cassette yeah i mean i'm not inclined to think that um um that cassettes generally sound good I, I like all the because all the stuff that i've recorded that's come out on cassette recently i honestly i haven't really checked it right. and maybe i don't those... think most people do i think people just buy it because it looks cool and they're gonna stream it anyways you know so yeah i, I just don't want to be disappointed and it's like I, I like the way it looks and that's good enough you know mm -hmm. um my the mastering person i use fred kevorkin he he doesn't think they sound good so i'm kind of letting right. it go um i'm kind of um, um it's a collector's item yeah, I also item. just, I mean, honestly, I just don't listen in a very audiophile way. I think because I'm, I'm I can't, I, I just need so to too. give, I need to give my brain a bit of a break. So when I listen to stuff, I, I have a computer over there that I like the speakers on. So it has a bit of bottom. Mm -hmm. That's good enough. I like kind of hearing what's 
what people are doing, but I just don't want to, I don't want to put on headphones with other, because I spend, when I do a mix, if I do an eight hour mix with people. Oh yeah. It's so fatiguing. Easily, easily half the time, about half the time, maybe I'm listening on headphones. I kind of go on and off, but there's a point mm-hmm. in the middle there where I'm like on headphones. I usually start a mix, not on headphones, then do the middle in headphones then go out of headphones again. Um, so that's a lot. So I'm not going to put up, get into this cocoon, mental cocoon, and have the, as Jimi Hendrix called it, the ear goggles on for, for other things when I'm not working. So I tend to be very, I don't want to use these speakers, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you would think that, that, that and I probably might not heard actually listen. Because most people are not listening in, to music on high quality speakers. They're actually listening to music on really shitty quality speakers most of the time. And also yeah. when I'm on, on my on my own time and I'm listening, might as well stuff. mix through your cell phone speakers, you know. I mean, also, also even my even my own stuff, like my personal music, I kind of like hearing it on like lower quality stuff because also for one thing, mm-hmm. psychologically, if I hear it on high fidelity stuff, I'm going to start like asking questions about what I already did that can't be changed anyway. So I'd yeah. rather just listen to it on like a little speaker off there in the corner, and, and it actually sounds good. So I'm happy with it. Well, I I am definitely leading into what you're currently doing, but I do have one more nerdy question for you, uh, sort of a follow up um, from the documentary. Do you still have that same board? Because I know in the documentary you talked about people are nostalgic about recording to tape, but you think the sound lies more through the board than than how it's recorded. Yeah, well, I actually still have the. Let me see. Can, I, can you see it? Yeah. I can't tell what you can because like, I I was fascinated by I watched like that documentary um, Dave Grohl did about that board from Sound Studios and. So it's like those boards, they they have a lot of personality. Why is that? And why what in particular about your board, you know, has made the music that you made sound the way it does? If you can even answer that. Yeah, I kind of can't answer it very well yeah. because I, I, I don't have experience with a lot of other boards. Because uh, you definitely just, have like a sort of sound to all your recordings, and I'm sure a lot of it has to do with the space and a lot of it has to do with the board. Has to do with the board and then also all the other stuff of how stuff's put together. Um, but I'm also um, not uh, eager to explore working on other, like one thing I never want to change, like I literally could be happy just not changing, is changing the monitoring. So I don't, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm, bef- I'm confused why anyone would want to like experiment with different monitors all the time. Um, some people do that. It'd be like, wow, if I'm going to listen on other monitors, I mean, I'm going to, it's going to take me months to get used to doing that. Right. Um, yeah. You know, also the very few times I've been in, an, in another studio. Um, uh, yeah. The, I mean, there's one song for this band season, a risk that, that was had to be done at Sony, the mix, the mix had to be done at Sony because it's for an out from a, for a record, something with Juliet Lewis. I can't remember the name of the, Oh, song. the licks. Oh, oh, that's her band. Yeah, but, for a movie, was it Strange Days? Could be, but it's the band. The band um, Season of Risk hmm. is on that, and so we had to mix a track. So we mixed it at Sony Studios in Manhattan. And the thing that was funny about that was, and then I think we remixed it for the actual album of the band Season of Risk. But we had to do a, a mix for the film. So I went to Sony Studios, and then I was like. Oh my God, that, that that gave me a sense of the bad experience, which was like, I put it up and it was like, it's fucking incredible. Like it sounded amazing, through, amazing through their speakers, amazing on their board. And it was like, wow, here's the problem. I don't even have to mix it. I don't even have to do anything. It just sounds so good. You put the faders up. Wow. Mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm. it was the weakest mix of everything, oh. you know? So it's very misleading. So I'm just not that eager. Yeah, I'm yeah. That, I, I, Cause I like, I like, uh, I don't know, maybe that's my personality. I think in, in for maybe other things, it's not the best quality to have that I don't I don't want to put myself in a new situations. You know, mm-hmm. I like using the tools that I'm familiar with and and then let, letting the music talk. And and I only really think of changing things or changing even a format. Like even my even my moving to digital, I only did it when it re- really became clear that I could be making better records and that standards had, had changed. Sure. Like yeah. for instance, when I mean, I it's so much that, easier to mix, right? Like, well, for one thing, when I realized it was no longer acceptable to run out of tracks. Right. You know, So that sort of thing. So when, once I start realizing, okay, the culture has changed and I could be making better records or something, then, then I made the switch, but generally I'm not eager to, um, 
to experiment. What is funny though is I'm still learning things about my own gear when shit happens. Mm. Like sometimes when mm. things break, when something breaks and I gotta just on the fly try something else, I'm like, oh, mm. uh, I guess that. Yeah, there's be- always there's always two or three ways to do everything, right? Yeah, and then then I realize, oh, this other thing which I thought was just kind of not that important actually is because I really can't do the same thing with this other thing, even though I didn't realize that it was such a big, massive difference, but it's a bigger mm. difference than I thought. So um, I kind of also, because here's the thing is the reason I don't experiment that much is uh, like even with my room, I have two massive chambers downstairs and I haven't tried every single thing you can try. And the reason is on whose dime am I going to experiment people? That's not what people are looking for. They want maybe a little bit of trying things, but mostly people ask me, what's, what's, what way do you recommend that? And I, I recommend things that are, um, I'm confident of, and it right. doesn't mean it's sure. going to sound, it doesn't mean it's going to sound only one way because part of the reason I pick that way might be because it has flexibility actually built in. Mm-hmm. Like I, I like, I don't like recording drums. I, I, I don't even want to try recording drums with few mics. That's a whole technique in itself. I don't want to mm-hmm. go there because again, who am I going to try that with? And then who am I, who am I going to go back to being a novice with? Cause if you, if you change mm-hmm. everything and you put me in a completely new situation, it's like, it's like uh, learning a new instrument. The person that played right. guitar now is going to have to play trombone. Is that, you know, right. maybe. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So it's like, why would I do that even to my clients? So I tend to find things that work and I, I tend to work within those things until the point where I realize, Oh, maybe I really should change my tune. So I don't really have a, a great answer. The board is the, the same board. And also it's what people want to see. They, they, they don't want to mm-hmm. come in and say, oh, I got this new thing. They're not looking for me to have a new thing. What they're more excited about is. No, I'm glad you still have that board. I mean, it's, it's so many it's crazy same. bands have been through that thing. Yeah. But also, like I said, is I've, I've, um, I, I've, uh, I've tried a lot of things like, like the boredom's record that you said, said as an example yeah, maybe. Wow, was, too. Wow, too, where, where it was like they had just had crazy ideas for putting microphones in weird places. But also, I think I learned from that. First of all, I was thrilled that they wanted to use the room. Mm-hmm, you, you know, because mm-hmm. not everyone did. This was this was this was a long time ago. There was a lot of yeah. people people that were still into recording in the padded room. Like so thirty like, years ago, yeah. Like, there's a lot of people that still wanted to record '70s style in a small booth with padding. And right. here were people that wanted to like, oh, we're in a cavernous warehouse. Let's put mics in crazy places. So right. Um, I don't quite do that anymore just because, like I said, on whose dime am I going to put mics in crazy places? But I did it with them because it also was nice because also there was less of a script. I had less of an idea even of what what that record should sound like. Yeah, I don't I don't know if there was a script for that record. (laughs) Yeah, that's what I mean. It it was like it was they were also interchanging genres a lot. So Mm -hmm. it's like, well, is it really supposed to sound like soul in this bit or, you know, like with Zorn? Some of it just sounds sort of like. I don't even know how to explain it. Very minimal, like just sound effects and maybe one instrument over here kind of thing. It was, it was a lot like I know some of their older records are like just them screaming and banging on everything. And this was like kind of the opposite of that for them. Yeah, um, it was a great time, too, because I think that they were on tour with Sonic Youth at that point. That makes sense. Sure. I think that's where, because I, I was hearing details about the tour. So I think that it was like at the end of it or in the middle of it. And maybe that's mm-hmm. why it was done so quickly. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. And maybe that's why they, they, I mean, this is just coming to me now. It's maybe mm-hmm. that's why they had such a, a, an idea of being experimental with the recording. Cause maybe they'd heard from Sonic Youth about what it was like to record here. Right. Um, yeah. So they, so, and Sonic Youth was very into being ex, doing experimental recording. Like that was, it wasn't even it wasn't mm-hmm. that experimental but compared to like traditional it wasn't your band. standard rock indie rock band yeah yeah and then and then with like a, a producer calling the shots i mean they were kind of i mean i didn't even think it was breaking rules i mean i didn't perceive i, I didn't know the rules myself you know but um the, the general ethic was because when we were when i mixed with sonic youth there wasn't a lot of automation i had a little bit of automation but we had to have mm-hmm. hands on the board so mm-hmm. a lot of the things in the mixing really were kind of collaborative mixing where we would kind sure. of have like, like people would just like, like, you know, Oh, the, the record you, sh- you showed with a uh, death Valley 69. Death Valley 69. Uh, which one was that? With the Lydia lunch. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It has death Valley 69, right? I think so. Let me, let me pull that back up. I just wanted to get their, both of their names, uh, 
in one swoop. Yep, Death Valley. Yep. Yeah, at the end of that song, you just hear a guitar fader just like in the last two seconds just crank all the way to the top. Mm. It's literally someone just reached over like from one side and just reached over to the other side of me and just threw the faders up. That's funny. And that's and but we would do stuff like that. I think with that that band and a few other bands, sometimes we would do five or six mixes with maybe a few rules and we would talk about put a little grease pencil on where the fader should be or the panning and just go. And then we would do like five or six mixes and then listen to them and then pick and then say, well the intro was nice on this one and the first verse was nice on the other one. Mm-hmm. And let's, you know, so so it was very interesting to do these sort of on the fly mixes where we would make composites of the mix with editing on tape. Right. But yet in the end, it might sound like it's a very cohesive mix with interesting stuff happening in different places, but yet it was totally done out of context, right? Interesting. Like yeah, there'd be sure. a mix. Maybe there'd be a mix that was just way guitar heavy. I guess or, or just, there's a lot less of that with the digital uh, era of mixing. Yeah, because you're being very, you're being very deliberate. So at the time, mm-hmm. we'd be like, oh, this one mix where it was like just someone had the guitar like way loud, like stupid loud. And it's like, well, where will that work? Maybe. And mm-hmm. then, uh, well, maybe just in this bit. All right. So it would be like, after the fact, then we would like edit it and go, okay, you know, then hear the guitar just gonna like explode <laughs> and, then, and then go back to the one where it was like a lot of the backup vocal or, you know, who knows. So tell me about this. You're putting out an album, what, next week? Yeah, it's uh, actually, it's coming out tomorrow. So d- tomorrow. Oh, there you go. Awesome. Well, the album, so at midnight. You know, oh, and that's, that's a good reminder that everybody tomorrow is band camp Friday. So go to band camp and buy some stuff. Go buy some Martin VC stuff. Go buy my record with Brian Viglione on it. Bandcamp yeah. Friday. All the money is going to go straight to the artists. That's right. Yeah, that's good. It's a great thing w- with Bandcamp. Um, but yeah, the record release show is next week. So that's December 8th, TVI. Yes, I have this uh, TVI. Yeah, I can't go because I do this show on Thursdays. But ah, okay. <laughs> I, I think I know Weeping Icon. I think I used to work with one of those guys. <laughs> oh, it's women. I think I used to work with some of those women. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 all women that band. Okay, I, I know the name. I think my friend Sarah is in that band. That's right. Wh- um, wh- I went to I went to college with her, and she actually was roommates for a long time with Valerie, who was in Black Tape for a Blue Girl when we saw them together. Oh, she was she so, was roommate. By the way, which because um until, yeah, it's it's like until <laughs> everything's like, connected. Until, until like three years ago, there was, until three years ago, everyone in um, Weeping Icon was named Sarah, except the drummer. Yeah, so, she's the bass player, the one I know. Yeah, she's still in it. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I went to college with her. I knew her when we were like 17. Yeah, so there's still two Sarahs in the band. So Man, Sarah, I really wish I could make that show. And then Sarah Fantry, who's the, um, Sarah Fantry, who's the, um, the guitar player and one of the singers, Sarah Fantry, is the person who's singing on that song, A Storm Called Ida. Okay. Awesome. Like that, that, that woman that's standing on the thing, like, like in white, mm-hmm. singing like opera in, in, the, in the song, A Storm Called Ida. That's Sarah Fantry from Weeping Icon. That's great. And yeah, she's it's all on, connected. And she, she's on three songs of Feral Myths. Yeah. And, and then where, the, yeah, where is Century Bar? It doesn't have an address in Philadelphia. In Philly. Hmm. Yeah. I think right? I think the word Philadelphia is on the flyer because it's oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, then the tenth. Where is this one? Cambridge, That's Massachusetts. Boston, Cambridge, yeah. So you got a little mini tour going on next week. It's a mini tour, and it's it'll be an interesting return to the to the tour crunch. You know, that mm. sort of, okay, the thing, the thing, okay. The thing, maybe, you know, yeah. maybe I could make the Philly show. Maybe I could drive out to Philly for that. Wow. Okay. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. It's, that's, I think that's a cool little bar where a lot of like weird. It's only, it's about two hour drive for me. Cause I, now I don't live in the city anymore. I can like drive places, you know? Yeah. And you different, different sense of things, right? Like two hours in the, in a car isn't necessarily always as bad as two hours on the subway exactly it's kind of like well shit it took me an hour to get to brooklyn every day if i was going to go to brooklyn anyways when i lived in astoria it's like in a car it's not that much different yeah yeah um 
what so what is the new album like is it uh, any different than your past work or and, and also i was trying to find your first record and it's not on streaming uh why is that not on streaming creole mass creole mass yeah i don't know i mean you would have to ask the the uh, mm. the person uh what's his name who, who um, owns that one yeah that's that was on the on the subsidiary of sst so it's okay. actually a new, subsidiary you know, of FST or just or on SST? Not SST, a subsidiary because there was a oh, there was wow. a label called New Alliance. Okay. Which, which yeah, it's probably launch. lost forever then. <laughs> well, I think that they kind of still have it, but it's uh, yeah, I'm sure they have it, but I think SST it? isn't that kind of like a disorganized record label kind of yeah, what's, what's the name of the that? guitar player? I'm really sorry. the guitar player from Black Flag is Greg Ginn. Greg Ginn. So Greg yeah. Ginn. Very good. For Greg right. Ginn. A lot of people are mad at SST because of Greg Ginn, I think. I don't know all the personal details, but. Yeah. Well, well, well Greg is. Um, yeah. Well, basically, it's all under whatever's left on SST or New Alliance is under his control. Mm -hmm. And I don't. He does not like reissuing things, apparently. It's like a oh, whole okay. uphill battle with him. Uh, from what I've heard, I don't know personally, but. Well, it's I, like if I you wish... if you release something on SST and it's out of print, it's like, good luck, dude. Yeah, but well, that's that's. Just, I mean, you can find Creole Mass from because the, it was a German label. So and and the German label made, hmm. um, made vinyl. And well, yeah, I'm sure it's on physical media, but it's not on Spotify or anything. No, like that. it's not. It's not. But the physical media, I think, is just the German one that's left. I think the the SS the the, the New Alliance one sold out. New Alliance was the label of Mike Watt. Okay. Minute. And then yeah, it sure. somehow ended up in Greg Ginn's hands. And that's also why that weird Sonic Youth thing called um, um, Into the Groovy or In the Groovy where it was the Madonna cover. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember yeah. you talking about that in the documentary. Yeah, that's on New Alliance too because that was before, when New Alliance was still Mike Watt, mm -hmm. basically, right? And so Mike Watt is the, it was the driving force of, of uh, Chicone Youth. And okay. then somehow yeah, my solo yeah. record ended up on that label too. And so now it's gone. Um, mm. But I think that Feral Myths is really, uh, t it's, it takes off from my previous record, which is called Ex Niculo. Actually, well, I have three records in a row that are all in evolution where I really, I think in 2000, it was pretty much like 2011, 2010, where I really had a big, um, mm. a big about face musically where I really just wanted to get a lot like, deeper in a way like a little a little i want to get a little crazier and like a little more not just crazier but like more psychological and so i went i i, I want to get usually my own personal music when it was an escape from everything i was working on with other people and i think with my first the first of these three records which was ex nihilo around 2011 i actually wanted to go right there so it's a little more of the psychological qualities of like something like swans for instance mm -hmm. And I want to explore a little bit of like uncomfortable, you know, mental health stuff, um, you know, and, and just kind of go deep about like humanity and where we came from. It really almost felt like an, an end of life, you know, legacy record, but luckily it wasn't the end of my life. But that's kind of what I felt at the time. Like I just wanted to kind of really nail what I was about in an essential way. So that was Ex Nihilo. And then I did an, another one, which is like maybe four years ago called Solstice. And that also had a little bit like solstice. One side is the winter side. One side's the summer side, like the mm. winter solstice and the summer solstice. And they both have very, very different qualities on the, the winter side of solstice is, is, a, is one contiguous song. So it's like an 18 or 19 minute song um, that goes through. Yeah, that one. There and it go. goes through different. Um, it's it's like it goes through like like pieces of songs like that's on the, the, the winter side, pieces of song, this songs that sort of. Um, overlap and grow from each other, right? It's just not as opposed to finished songs. And then the mm. new one, I think this the new one, Feral Myths, is I tried to, um, for one thing, kind of get back into a little bit of more songwriting, and and but but not abandon the crazy. So I started mm. kind of trying to like bridge, because I, I think with Ex Nihilo in particular and parts of Solstice, I just went way out I, I went as far out as you can go like like difficult listen lots of dis yeah minutes. yeah and what the last song is like 20 minutes long isn't it yeah well on on solstice the this mm -hmm. the this unbirth unbirth is like it's like 19 minutes or something 
and that's the winter side. Like unbirth is just the winter side, and it sort of implies like, like just being in, you know, around the solstice when you're just like enclosed or something and not going outside because it's, you know, you're you're kind of stuck with yourself a little bit. Unless mm. you're going to a party, you're stuck with yourself. It's kind of how it's kind of how that time of year feels to me. So that that whole song unbirth, what's like the opposite of like springtime. Um, yeah, that's so, so I think with, with, um, feral myths, I try to bring some songwriting back, but, but not abandon the crazy. So it's really a, this, it's, it's actually not a big departure from the previous two records. It's just, I'm in this mode. I've been in this mode for about a sure. decade and I'm just finessing it. And it's just a, another step. Well, here it is. Bandcamp Friday. Is it Bandcamp Friday yet? It's midnight, but it's Pacific time. So you got two hours and 59 minutes to wait and then go pick up go pick up our records on Bandcamp. here's one i skipped uh before we end pig uh i love pig what um how did how did you end up working with pig that's more of the industrial side of things right yeah is that um is jim thorwell in that at all or um i mean Pig is mostly Raymond Watts is like the main guy, but who he could have been involved at some point because, you know, these industrial bands, they're kind of like all super groups. He was in KMFDM for a while. Yeah, that's I remembered from that world. Wow. I'm sorry. I just remember so little. That's OK. My, my name is on there. Uh, apparently, yeah. <laughs> okay. I guess so. You know why? Well, that's I, cool. I, yeah, Pig, he's still making records. Well, I stumped a little bit. It's really great. It's vague, but also I worked on Let's Pig see. Face. Oh, yeah, that's that's different. Um, pig probably was in Pig Face, but what did you do with Pig Face? That was one of these things because I, 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 um, so I've seen Pig Face when they used to play BB Kings, um, and I met Martin Atkins a couple times. Right. Well, yeah, it was a Chicago Martin Atkins thing. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing: is that in the in the in the 90s in the 90s there was a lot of like remixing yeah yeah uh, uh, yeah which, which honestly i just didn't like doing it's just that simple like mm. me me when i work with a band and if they want me to be a bit more of a producer or even mixing you know what i want to do is really get at the essence of a band that's what i want to do like i i really i i i try to find out about their stories i i, I like getting to know the artist or the artists and just try to understand where they're coming from and i, I try to like if anything, make that more clear, like sharpen up the, the vibe, whatever it is, mm. even if it's not actually sharpening something, you know, whatever that is, just to make sure it really comes through and just really get at their essence of what they really are, what they're trying to do. For I, I care about the lyrics and um, and somehow making the lyrics live a little bit with some production choices. You know, you can I think you can lead people's brains a lot with like subtle production stuff. Like just making them think about certain words or giving the words a con making them seem funnier or more introspective or something, but de depending on how the background sits, this sort of mm. thing, right? <clears throat> and um, remixing was the opposite. So people would, so basically it was like a marketing thing, right? So you'd have these major yeah, labels. Yeah. And yeah, they, they used to sell things called CD singles back in the day. And <laughs> yeah, well, well, also they would, they would literally do these remixes uh, of to, to actually try to make it sound like a different genre. Right. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and um, so Jim Thurwell, Fetus, he loved deconstructing music and and reinventing the song, maybe taking the vocals out or kind of, you know, like making it. He loved that sort of creativity. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's not I mean, first of all, I like that process and I liked working with Jim on his vision for mm -hmm. that. But I personally didn't like the idea of doing that. So I didn't really like right. the idea of of getting because even Jim Thurwell asked me, you know, should he try to help me get some remix work? Because it was kind of lucrative, right, at the mm -hmm. time. So he was like, do you want me to put your name in? Or maybe you can get some remix. Because I wasn't doing any. I was just, I was doing remix work with him, you know, mm -hmm. so as the engineer. And I was happy actually right. doing that. Um, and I was like, yeah, you know, I'm just not, I'd rather work with like a band and, get, and make their, that come alive rather than make mm -hmm. an industrial version of like a punk band or whatever it was, you right. know, or right. a punk version of a pop band. Right. It wasn't exactly what I was feeling. So my point is, this is a lot of this whole period. There was a lot of stuff that was not recorded here or that and was not recorded by Jim Thurwell either that we just did remixes of. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pig so Face, was, yeah, they were definitely in the middle of that world because, I mean, that was just sort of a whole experimental, you know, 
basically those were all just remixes of themselves i i would say right so so in a there, weird way. there was the, so so there was that so i'm i'm sorry if i'm not differentiating pig yeah. from pig face but pig pig was probably involved with pig face cuz it's definitely in that sort of world yeah it's um, sounding familiar is that how you probably got involved with like murder inc as well murder inc was the same thing i think that's yeah. i think thirwell's in that mix yeah no i think so and i think but, those guys were in pig face. Like everyone was in pig face. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I really get confused between pig face and murder Inc, but all, all that stuff was great. I mean, I, I love doing it. Um, but it was just basically really, it's Jim Thurwell's thing. At least those particular tracks were Jim Thurwell's tracks. Mm -hmm. Um, but people were trying stuff. There was, um, a Sonic youth track from, I think, I think from sister called white cross. And, uh, they, they even Sonic youth said, let's get a Jim Thurwell. Um, remix right so Jim, yeah and, and we're all pals sure. right so you know like you know uh, me and sonic people sometimes go to jim's house for parties right so mm -hmm. we're all friends but they they were like oh let's get jim thorwell and then and then jim again as as with a lot of his remixes did it here so it was funny for me to, to be working as a mm -hmm. remix engineer for a sonic youth track that i didn't yeah. record with jim thorwell but we did and uh i, I think it just didn't fly the reinventing the reinventing of Sonic Youth was not a winner, mm -hmm. so th so I yeah. think that Look, that taught he that did taught some that. Pop Will Eat Itself remixes. I see. What's that? J uh, Jim, he did some Pop Will Eat Itself remix. He, I see. He did right. Yeah, yeah, and Nine Inch Nails. That's probably how I first heard his name was from through Nine Inch Nails. Yeah. Um, well, he also um, a lot of the Fetus records. And and Trent Reznor was in Pig Face at one point, so there's uh, all that there's all that also, kind of connection. Also, a lot of the Fetus records before I met Jim, before I really met Jim, because I I met him, I I met Jim even before I met him. So mm -hmm. um, um, so before I actually like officially met him, I I, I was very uh, impacted by his productions. Like it definitely was it was very overblown in a way that I liked, right. That, that, that it was just like, it was bigger than life mm -hmm. and it was bigger than life in a way that, cause I also liked bigger than life. Actually. I just liked it in a different way than he was doing, but the way that Jim was doing, um, it was, it was a bit colder than what I would do. And, um, uh, I think that his production actually made a bigger impact than the actual songs or the lyrics and, and the fetus stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I think his, his distinctive vocals, right? Because he he also used to like, like sort of he was there seemed to be a lot of, of uh, of play acting criminals, right? Like mm. you know, uh, I'm coming to get you, or, right? You know, yeah, like like, like <laughs> sure. every, murderers and killer, and you know, like like I I think that although it's surprising how much music that came out of here that that was like exposés of crime, you know, and like horrific crime, even when you think of you know, like white zombie. It's like a friggin' yeah. It's a horror movie. Yeah. Yeah. So some reason that era really inspired a lot of, of maybe that of addressing that darkness or something. Um, but yeah. So basically, the fetus production was uh, made a big statement when when something like that was rare and uh, like he he over blew the eighties. Like it was more eighties than the eighties or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I think that 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 uh, served him well in terms of like going on with these other. And because I always respected what he did, and so I was kind of into like participating in this um, experiment in production with him. But it's very different than what I would do on my own. So this thing of me working with with Jim, also just an example. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not dying to put me into things. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. I, I recognize that that's what happens. But, but ideally, I'd like to, th I'd like to think it's not. I really do have. I think I do have some commonality in different things. A, co a commonality comes out. But that's not what I'm going. I, I'm, but but um, sure. You want to compliment going, what the band is doing or or the that's artist? That's what I'm hoping for. Sorry, mm. I'm getting a little. Uh, yeah, it's okay. That's well, if you can, if you can believe it. We've been talking for over three hours already. I oh, think wow. it's a good. This is a good probably place to to put a pin in it. We'll probably we, maybe we could do this again sometime because this has sure, been a fascinating course. conversation, and um, that's that's part of why I started this show so I could actually have good conversations with people you know that like i've passed by you in the clubs but we didn't never, never had like a like this you know 
Yeah, that's funny. So I think we I'm never so tired. I'm so over trying to have meaningful conversations in like loud clubs and venues. You know, it's just like, forget it. Yeah, sorry, discipline. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. but that's hard. I mean, I've, I'm I'm already worried about my show next week. That it's going to be a lot of Irish goodbyes because I think a lot of my friends are going to be coming there, and it's hard to you know. Yeah, it's tough. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's funny because so many of our relationships is on uh, in the music scene are always so kind of cursory. People I know, but I don't really right. know them. Right. And yeah. Also exactly. With recording yeah. Stuff. But that's that. right. It's it's kind of mutant. I think it's kind of mutant the way we, we kind of all are in the end, we have just our few little close connections. And it's really nice when you can kind of go a little further with someone like yourself, like we've known each yeah, other. Yeah. That's why I, I love doing we've this. Known each other well over a decade. Yeah. But like hardly, like, <laughs> I don't even know if you knew who I was when I asked you to do this. No, I remember, I, I, I suspected it was you. It was, it was yeah, person. yeah. I vaguely remember how you looked and I saw the name and I was like, oh yeah, that's him. Right. Yeah. Good. Well, you have a good memory. <laughs> well, some things. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I think this is a good place to, to end it for tonight. Um, go okay. Band Camp Friday. Go buy our fucking records. Go to check out Martin BC on on his mini tour next week. Yeah. And I'm sure much more music to come. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's coming. It always keeps coming. Well, so. thank you so much. Yeah, it's going to be one of my goals to, uh, to get a band to your studio while it's still yeah, there. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, I'd really like yeah, to. I just, that, 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 I never, you know, it's so hard to keep a band together, let alone like organize a recording session. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite aware of that. Of yeah, that. yeah. I try to make that part of it go smoothly so people don't fucking break up. Yeah, exactly. Was... Yeah, and maybe if Brian visits, visits New York at all, maybe I can get him in there. Yeah, and me. I should listen, listen to your stuff with Brian. I haven't heard it. Yeah, check he... it out. I mean... It's all DIY. I basically recorded it all in my bedroom, except for the uh, guests sent in their own parts. He recorded that in Los Angeles in his friend's studio. Um, yeah, he's on two of the songs on my new record. It's a short record. It's about 30 minutes. Go check it out. You know, get me some Spotify plays or whatever. Put it on a playlist. Do all those things. Like, share, subscribe, comment below. To help Click. the algorithm. Yes. <laughs> You're watching this right now. Click the like subscribe and actually that's how oh here's here's what i'll play us out with uh, i loved how you said before that you um felt some kind of connection to to the 90s mentality right and when i was preparing for this i was going through your youtube and watching some of your old music videos and i thought this was the most 90s thing i'd ever seen in my life and i mean that as a compliment so maybe we could just talk over this while uh, while we end the show. Oh wow! <laughs> this I was just I was watching this. I was just like, this is so '90s. It's unbelievable. Really? It's me in Spanish. Right. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> <laughs> is this embarrassing for you? No, it's not. It's you know, I think it's a little embarrassing. Yeah. Well, yeah. I want to embarrass you a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So you know who that is, right? The woman. No, who is that? That was that's Christina Martinez from Boss Hog. That's John Spencer's Oh wow. Wife. Okay, Boss Hog. I remember that name. Yeah. They were on Amphetamine Reptile. Mm hmm And um, yeah, it was crazy that I got her to sing on my song. Um, and it's in Spanish. We're singing in Spanish. And I think it's because well she's a Cuban American. Mm hmm And uh, she uh, was excited to be able to play for her mom a song where she sings in Spanish. That's mm. all. That's the reason. Because I actually hadn't recorded Boss Hog then at that point. Is that you playing drums? Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, I, I play all the instruments on this thing. Is this drums. recorded in that studio? Yeah. Nice. So, yeah, I just um, I saw this. I was like, oh my God, this is so unbelievably 90s. This is something you would see like pop up at like 3 in the morning on MTV in like 1993. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, also some of them, like the scratching of the, the scratching of the, of the, the frames of the celluloid, yeah. that, that was film. That's all film. So right. I, yeah, I mean, it looks was, like it. So that was all hand set, done? Yeah, the director set wow. me up with that. The director, like, you, you see how the Christina went across the thing? So the director set me up with that and showed me how to, like, dig in with, like, a, 
with like a quill. It was like a little metal quill just to just to peel away, just to carve out, scratch basically, scratch the celluloid, and then mm -hmm. just do each frame in a row so you could almost like animate. Wait, so you did that yourself? Well, he did some of it, and okay. I did some of it, and he showed me how to do it because just so it was hours. It's and hours. so time consuming, that, yeah, frame by frame. Like, Jesus, that, 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 like that little spiral that spiraled yeah. out there. Yeah, I would do that. So he would, would edit, and then just it was done at different times, and so then he would uh, say, "Okay, maybe you can scratch in this part if you want." And then where I'd, is yeah, this? Like where is this filmed? Well, this is crazy stuff. That's Catterskill Falls, the big waterfall there. That's Catterskill Falls in um, the Catskills. Okay. Like near near Palinville. There. That, yeah. Near Palinville in New York State, upstate. And and the other thing that looks like a cave, which you'll mm -hmm. see at the end, I think we end in a cave. That yeah. cave is near New Paltz. It's in the Shawangunk Mountains, like in the ridge. Shawangunk Ridge outside of New Paltz, New York, where there's okay. like these ice caves. So you can go along these trails and there's like these... Yeah, there's basically these caves that you can go into that where the, the, the ice has split the rocks apart. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the scenes are in a cave. Like in the beginning of the, of the video, you see that. Yeah, all that I think it starts there. All that shit. Yeah, it's just so, it's so 90s. I love it. <laughs> we, we, we were scratching. And then with magic marker, with permanent mag magic marker, we'd, um, hmm. we'd, like there, there's nothing. But then in others, we'd, we'd color in the places that were scratched out. That's um, so cool. Yeah, but what's interesting is that technique was something that the uh, that, I know I start freaking out here at the end of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, that director, he did stuff for John Spencer, and see, there, there we are in the cave. Mm -hmm. He did stuff with John Spencer and also Dinosaur Junior, and some of that mm -hmm. stuff got played on 120 minutes. So yeah, that that's exactly what I was thinking. Like the 120 yeah. minutes, uh, well, alternative well, nation. Yeah, you might have been thinking of other videos by that same director, Jim Sprint. Could be. I mean, it just yeah. seems very zeitgeisty in that in that style. Yeah, and, and I think at that technique, I think he was the one that developed that technique, and uh, that technique you ended up finding seeing in like commercials, right? You know, like yeah. like that sort of sensibility of the scratching on the celluloid. So it's um, yeah. Well, thanks for digging that. It's up. unbelievable. They did that animation on film. Yeah, and you would never do that these days. It's just, well, uh, we, we got, we've got so accustomed to, to, to have undo that the idea mm -hmm. of anything being mm -hmm. like 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 no undo. It's a savior, like, though. It, it's, it's, it's a savior, it's, it's but a it's also world. like like the, the, the stuff I would boldly do without an undo is kind of incredible. It was like guts. Yeah. I, I had guts. Right. Yeah. That's yeah, I know. Really, it's you're crazy. gonna take a razor blade to that tape and cut our only take? Yes, that's guts. One way to put it. Well, that's that's a good ending quote, I think. <laughs> uh, next week, if you want to talk about World Inferno, I'm gonna be talking about World Inferno with this guy. He actually did a short film with uh, Jack Terry Cloth, the singer, and was one of his good friends. Um, I just filmed a short film with him that was at a film festival in Brooklyn that he put on. So I don't even know what we're going to talk about, but it'll be fun. And then you ever heard of Lexa Terrestrial? She's actually out in Philly. I wonder if I can get her out to your show on Friday, next Friday. Oh, that'd be cool. That'd uh, be she's so a rapper. She's on my new record as well. Um, uh -huh. She's a, she's an alien. And that'll be interesting. I don't know what's going to be the next week, but the week after that, the Manimals. Do you know the Manimals at all? I think I've heard of them, actually. Yeah, they, um, I think, are one of the best rock bands in New York City. They're playing a couple shows coming up as well. Go check them out. I've done some of their music videos and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, that's what's coming up on Von Pod. Thank you so much, Martin VC. This has been so much fun. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, all you yeah. out there in the sphere. <laughs> and uh, I'll see you next week. Like, share, subscribe, comment below. Like, share, subscribe.